Hola, 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 hola. Hola. Okay, uh, I don't know if we can begin now. Everything set. Right. Well, good morning to you present uh, here. Uh, because this is uh, an Npiang event, uh, I'm going to be speaking in, in English. It's being uh, streamed directly by YouTube. So, good morning to you. It is now. Can you hear me now? There? Oh, yes. So, again, uh, good morning um, to you present and uh, those who are joining online, uh, well, good day to, to them. Well, um, today we're going to be presenting a joint uh, MBCOM and uh, PTGCC event. It's a symposium. Uh, it's uh, called Pyang's Vision on environmental and climate changes to the development of waterborne transportation and port infrastructure. So, um, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, invite our uh, engineering manager, uh, Federico, to say a few words uh, from our local port authority as a, as a welcome. Please. Well, hello to everybody. Welcome to the port of Bahia Blanca. I'm going to switch uh, into Spanish uh, because I want to be clear with the message. So if you can put your uh, headphones on, thank you. Thank you very much. Bueno, bienvenidos a, a todos. Eh, la verdad que estamos muy, muy expectantes y muy, muy contentos de realizar esta, estas jornadas en, en el puerto de Bahía Blanca. Hoy eh, tratará de un simposio cuyo tema, bueno, ya lo adelantó Gerardo, pero tiene que ver con la visión del PIANC acerca de los desafíos climáticos y medioambientales en el desarrollo de infraestructura portuaria. Esto se da en el marco de una reunión semestral de la Comisión Ambiental en BICOM y además del Grupo de Trabajo Permanente de Cambio Climático. Eh, hoy es un simposio, pero los lo, las reuniones de trabajo se van a desarrollar desde el lunes, desde ayer, hasta el viernes con un cierre en la Ciudad de Buenos Aires. La verdad que eh, estas jornadas vienen al puerto de Bahía en un momento, eh, yo creo que es histórico, un momento bisagra para el puerto de Bahía Blanca, eh, donde nuestro puerto creemos que es un eslabón clave en, la, en todo lo que es la transición energética del país, eh, con lo cual esperamos que en el puerto de Bahía Blanca vengan grandes inversiones que van a llevar asociadas grandes desarrollos en nuestra infraestructura portuaria. Este desarrollo... Eh, nosotros tenemos la obligación de realizarlo de forma responsable, resguardando el medio ambiente y sobre todo que redunde en beneficios para la comunidad. Eso es muy importante para nosotros. Y es por eso que desde hace años eh, el puerto de Bahía Blanca tiene representantes en las comisiones del PIANC, una institución muy reconocida en el sector de la ingeniería portuaria, 
Eh, y hoy eh, tenemos un representante por Argentina, que es nuestro jefe del área de dragado y balizamiento, eh, quien bueno, ha, se ha puesto un poco eh, la camiseta, la 10, decimos nosotros, y ha llevado todas estas jornadas eh, adelante. Eh, los ejes temáticos que se van a abordar eh, son de sumo interés, yo creo que están en las agendas de los principales puertos del mundo. Eh, y bueno, como decía antes, es un orgullo que después de casi 25 años el PIANG vuelva a reunirse eh, en Argentina y en concreto eh, en nuestro puerto de Bahía Blanca. La calidad de los expositores y el temario es, eh, digamos, bueno, no hay, no hay mucho que decir, eh, es de suma, de suma calidad, con lo cual creo que estas jornadas van a ser enriquecedoras tanto para los asistentes y espero también para los expositores. Así que sin más, eh, les doy la bienvenida y comencemos con, con el simposio. Gracias. Uh, thank you, Federico. Well, the symposium is going to be divided in four sessions. In the morning, we're going to have two sessions uh, we have um, relative to MBCOM. And in the afternoon, we're going to have two other sessions uh, related to PTGCC. So uh, the, we're going to have three expositors per session, and uh, we'll have about 25 minutes of exposition, and then the possibility to do a Q&A for about five minutes. So uh, without further ado, uh, are we going to start with the first session? Um, The session is uh, MBCOM's Piank role for the achieving of more sustainable navigational infrastructure. On the first term, we're going to have uh, Burton. Uh, Burton is, uh, well, he's our chair, uh, the chair of MBCOM since uh, last year. And uh, I must say he was on, on uh, the idea of coming over from the very first uh, Uh, he was the one actually who, who who told me, okay, let's let's go to Argentina and let's have a uh, a meeting there. So much of what's happening today is thank you, thanks to Burton. So thank you for having uh, well faith in us, and uh, we'll I will I'll leave you to to do your presentation. Yeah, okay. Um, we're going to be sitting here in 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 front. Those of us in in the first session and uh, uh, also well uh, you're going to do a brief uh, presentation of what is actually MBCOM for those of you who are not uh, okay, familiar with it. Thank you very much, Gerardo. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here in Bahia Blanca and uh, very appreciative of uh, the, po the port here uh, hosting us this week. So thank you very much. Yeah, it was almost five years ago. It was pre-pandemic uh, that we started talking about coming down here. Hey, let's let's have the port host one of our, one of our meetings. And so it's been a long five years, but uh, really appreciate it and glad that we came. Uh, very excited uh, to talk to you today also uh, as chair of the Environmental Commission. My the first presentation today is going to be a broader overview. The idea is to set up many of the excellent presentations that follow. And I, this is going to be a little bit uh, broader, give you a little bit of a sense for why we're here and what we are going to be talking about today, particularly in terms of PIANC and the Environmental Commission and the role that we're playing in terms of addressing sustainability, uh, particularly in the face of a changing climate. So my first slide before I get into the nitty gritty of my presentation, I want to give you a brief overview of the Environmental Commission. What you see here is a, a brief overview 
And I'm going to read you uh, the essentially uh, the, the primary statement. What's the mission of the Environmental Commission? That's to provide a practical science-based guidance to shape and inform future environmental practice in the development and operation of sustainable navigation infrastructure. Uh, as Director, I am the chair of MVCOM. We also have the secretary, uh, Eddie Brower, who is sitting right over here to my left. Uh, he's an indispensable member of the commission. He does a lot of the day-to-day uh, uh, -day connections and communications with us. We also have uh, YP. YP. YP stands for Young Professional. Uh, we, we currently, that position is vacant. Uh, we had someone in there that was very, very good, but uh, he aged out. He got too old. Uh, I told him not to, but he did anyway. We have 37 members from 18 countries and seven partner or organizations uh, that you see here. So our breadth and, uh, is, is pretty widespread across the world. So then, thinking about climate change and looking at how nations and ports around the world are seeing climate change, a lot of us are seeing the same impacts. Whether you're in the continental U.S., whether you're in small island states, whether you're in small island developing states, whether you're in the U.S., whether you're in Europe, whether you're in Southeast Asia, whether you are in Central America or South America, all of us are seeing impacts of climate change. And so if we ask ourselves questions, then if we, how are we gonna respond to climate change? Are we gonna respond, respond in a way like, oh, this is simply just a challenge. But when we're faced with a challenge, we then have that presents to us an opportunity then to ask questions like, are we can continue to operate and build and manage water resources infrastructure the way that we always have in terms of business as usual? Are we gonna take this as an opportunity to change the way in which we go about doing our business for water transportation? So it, to me, it offers an opportunity to innovate. In the United States, we have an unprecedented number of billion dollar disasters as a result of natural hazards. Certainly for us, it, it's hurricanes, but um, cyclones in other parts of the world. So it doesn't matter if it's a hurricane or a cyclone, but that's not the only aspect of climate change that's impacting us. Certainly in the United States, you may have heard uh, all about the wildfires and the droughts that we have in the Western part of the US. So that's certainly part of the climate change that we're dealing with. But also, it's not just us. You probably heard about the Panama Canal, the drought that they have in the Panama Canal and how it's impacting uh, certainly uh, waterborne transport worldwide. So the question is, let's use this as an opportunity to innovate, find ways to be more sustainable, not only organizationally within the Army Corps of Engineers where I work, but it's a great opportunity, I think, also for PA organizationally to start asking themselves questions is, can, should we change the way in which we go about doing business uh, as a society? There are many, many definitions of sustainability out there. So I think it's really important uh, to really set the tone in terms of what sustainability means for water transport infrastructure. For a very overarching idea, sustainability can be defined as creating both present and future value. It's present and future value. It's for people, but also for the environment. Not one, but the other. How sustainability covers both. So how can we do this for both people and the environment? That has gone through the three pillars of sustainability, the social, the environmental, and the economic. This is consistent with the Piank uh, strategic plan, talking about how uh, Piank can be a more sustainable organization. What we really haven't done is really put that pen to paper to say exactly how we're gonna go about accomplishing that task. Just last month, in the journal Terra at Aqua, 
the International Association for Dredging Companies, I think rel relatively conveniently for what we have this week, uh, gave, I think, a great definition for sustainability as relates to waterborne transport infrastructure. So I'm going to read that to you. Sustainability is achieved in the development of infrastructure by efficiently investing the resources needed to support the desired social, environmental, and economic services generated by infrastructure for the benefit of current and future generations. Again, it's looking at ways to not only look for opportunities for people, but also the environment uh, concurrently. I think too, in terms of how to define sustainability and what that looks like to us, others have done a great job for us. Certainly the United Nations standing up the 17 sustainable development goals in 2015 for accomplishment by 2030. Uh, that's just a few short years away. So we, we've got a ways to go, okay? And so let's not develop these goals ourselves because I think it's already done for us. I think depending upon who you ask, particularly the IADC argues uh, in their 2018 book on sustainable dredging, all 17 of the sustainable development goals can be addressed by the sustainable management of dredge material. So I'll go a little bit in greater detail uh, going forward. So I, I, think, I think the guidepost have already been set for us and offers a guide for us uh, going forward in terms of how we can meet, uh, how we can be more sustainable. So what is PIANC and what is the Environmental Commission as NBCOM, what are we doing currently to really address this concept of sustainability and do that in a way that's more deliberate and organized organizationally? Well, we have developed, we have begun developing still in progress this white paper on sustainability in terms of defining what that means to PIANC organizationally. And so the idea here is to really develop that and to identify how PIANC can really put that in their strategic plan. For example, through the development of a permanent task group on sustainability, because sustainability is not just about the Environmental Commission, it's not just about the permanent task group on climate change that we're gonna hear more about later on today. That cross cuts the other commissions as well. Inland navigation, recreation navigation, maritime, all those are touched by sustainability. There are a number of sustainability enablers uh, that have uh, been uh, accomplished by PIANC over the years. And I thought it would be really good to share those with you. Uh, the first one here, uh, the standing up of the white paper in 2008 on this overarching philosophy that we call working with nature. When we start our navigation infrastructure project, let's start thinking about, let's think about beyond people up front. Let's think about the environment as well, early and often. Not in a sense like you're most of the way through the design and implementation of the project. Oh, wait a minute, we gotta think about the environment. No, let's think about it early and often. Let's bring the environment component of people in the environment early into the process. That was the overarching philosophy uh, that was stood up in 2008. But implementation in practice was also required. And so those are the other two sides, corners of the triangle there. The EcoShape Consortium, that initiative stood up in the Netherlands and Europe in general to really put working with nature in practice. Also in the United States, we stood up engineering with nature for implementation of working with nature in practice. Hey, I work for the, large, the largest uh, public engineering organization in the world, so of course we're gonna call it engineering with nature. But again, it's engineering, it's people uh, and the environment. Also, PIANC had the declaration on climate change in 2019 that was concurrent with uh, COP25 in Madrid recognizing that organizationally, uh, we needed to step up and address climate change meaningfully as an organization. But we also recognized that that does not have to 
costs a lot of money it does have does not have to cost a lot of time sometimes that there are things that we can do that are relatively inexpensive to address climate change and we also recognize too that this is going to take time one of the key aspects for us uh, certainly within the Army Corps of Engineers, we, we relocate, we dredge over 200 million cubic meters of sediment every year. So dredging is a very, very important part of our mission to maintain the safe navigation of the nation's waterways. And so a, a progression has happened over my professional life. Of course, I'm a little bit older than many of you, but still, that's great news over the past 30 years or so. Going back to the 1990s, in terms of the guidance manuals that we were developing, it was all about minimizing harm that dredging had on the environment. By 2008, the environmental aspects of dredging, we realized, hey, it's not just on the negative side. Dredging and the beneficial use of dredge material actually can have positive effects on the environment. So let's take advantage and look of how that can be positive. By 2018, IADC published the Dredging for Sustainable Infrastructure. It was all about how dredging can be an integral part of being uh, part of a sustainable organization, sustainable way in which we can manage dredge material. There's a lot of resources coming out of that, and I wanted to share that with you. Unfortunately, it's all in English, but uh, we do what we can. Uh, the Central Dredging Association, CETA, has a great website on sustainable sediment management. I, I encourage you to, to take a look at that. It's a great resource in terms of identifying uh, sustainable uh, dredge material practices. Certainly within the Army Corps of Engineers, where, where I work, uh, we have similar resources. We have a dedicated website for the beneficial use of dredge material. And we have a lot of then connections to other resources related to beneficial use as well. I've already mentioned uh, the book on uh, dredging for sustainable infrastructure. You see that in the bullets here on the uh, bottom. But I wanted to share that really. What are the enablers then for more sustainable use of dredging material? It's that stakeholder engagement, the meaningful stakeholder engagement early and often in the process. And then partnering, certainly partnering, collaboration. Those are keys uh, to achieving sustainable uh, port and infrastructure projects, certainly as we see it uh, in the US and also with partners uh, that we work with worldwide. So I want to share a little bit more with you about the Environmental Commission or NVCOM and, and some of the working groups uh, and working group reports that we had published uh, recently, particularly as they're relevant to sustainability. We have a fairly good track record, I think, over time of publishing these reports. Uh, this is within the last five years. A couple of us in the room uh, were very, very pleased uh, to publish in 2018 uh, the report on working with nature. We had we had talked about the overarching philosophy uh, that was uh, that came out in the white paper, but we really didn't provide any information in terms of how that would be implemented in practice. And so uh, that working group uh, report uh, is a great way of how that can be achieved uh, in practice during during your day jobs. And what I like too, it's got a lot of case studies, the success stories uh, for how that has been implemented uh, by us and others. When we think about cost and benefits, we think about the benefits, how, how do we quantify those benefits, particularly on the environmental side? This is not something that we have a long track record of doing, but ecosystem services is a way in which we can accomplish that. And so the publication of Working Group uh, 195 report on ecosystem services published two, two years ago uh, gives a great example and provides some, some information on how you can go about doing that. I know Victor and I are very, very excited by the publication earlier this year uh, on the beneficial use of sustainable waterborne transport infrastructure projects. And so that was uh, in terms of that, that, that was about a five year effort. And, and you know, it started out as, oh, it's a quick 18 months. We can, we can, we can roll that out. It never, it never works out that way. But it's important too, in terms of collaboration and partnering, that was not, it was all about peeing, but we had CEDA representation, we had WIDA representation, that's a Central Dredging Association, and the Western Dredging Association uh, uh, 
representatives on that too. So uh, that's a very overarching uh, great uh, document uh, as well. Also additional working groups, uh, 157, 170, 174, sustainability reporting for ports. Uh, so some of these have more links to sustainability uh, than others. But my point, look, my point would be looking forward, looking ahead. I think sustainability is gonna play a bigger role in terms of the content of our NVCOM uh, reports uh, in the future. What's important to us too, and I mentioned this, is sustainability is not just about the Environmental Commission. It cross cuts the other technical commissions. And because of that, I think it's gonna be a growing importance for us to have representation across those technical commissions. So the Inland Navigation Commission, 203 on sustainable inland waterways, that had representation also from MBCOM. And so I think that cross commission representation, I think helps improve those documents in terms of being an international standard of practice on that subject. I think it really helps flush them out. RECCOM 148, that's recreation navigation. Okay, we had, we had great NVCOM reviews on that one. INCOM 236, sustainable management of the navigability of free flowing rivers. That is in progress, but we have INCOM and MBCOM representation on that. And that's gonna improve that report as well. And it gives you a sense for I think where we're going is the, the terms of reference that we're standing up right now is on blue carbon. And you can imagine blue carbon, that does cut across all those technical commissions that you see there. And so that's a good example, I think, for where we're going and why it's so important for us to reach across the commissions uh, to generate these reports. This is just an example of uh, one of the graphics that we had published for the INCOM report on 203 in terms of sustainable inland uh, waterways. The idea here, uh, looking at that graphic, there's nothing in there that has anything to do about inland navigation. It's really all about sustainability, looking at you know, what that means for uh, navigation uh, infrastructure and, and what that means and what we should be looking at in terms of sustainability uh, for these types of projects. This is a draft uh, out of the white paper that's still in progress. And so I take full responsibility for any errors or any improvements that you see to this. And so just wanted to let you know, looking at the relationship uh, between the UN Sustainable Development Goals and PIANC as a society, as an organization, and those relationships between the PIANC strategic plan uh, that talks about sustainability going forward. And then how does that mission get put into place? And that is through the technical framework, the working group report that we are publishing, several of which I shared with you in, in the previous slides. So that then is informed by the underlying principles of the economic, the societal, and the environmental in terms of the three sustainability pillars. And those are then informed by the broad frameworks. And I recommend as guideposts, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This is shown to really be kind of a linear relationship. I would probably argue that it's probably not linear and that there's a lot more relationships between these uh, elements of the graph than what you see here, but we're still working on it. <coughs> so there's a lot of sustainability supports both in the recent past, but I think also going forward. And I covered a lot of these already, but this is what we try to do is maintain this consistency. I, I wear several hats here. So I wear the Army Corps of Engineers hat. I wear the PANC hat. I wear the Environmental Commission hat. And so where do those intersect? Where is that intersection? How can the Army Corps of Engineers help support PIANC and, and vice versa? And so the idea is to look for those opportunities and this gives you a sense uh, for what we're doing. Certainly, I think on the sustainability front, uh, and Dan is gonna talk to us a little bit later, certainly the standing up of the permanent task group on climate change uh, has had a big positive impact, I think for us organizationally from a PIANC perspective. Now I'm gonna share with you a couple of documents that, that, that we are publishing within the Army Corps of Engineers is very, very consistent with this idea of sustainability and how the Army Corps of Engineers is addressing this idea of climate change. 
it wasn't not it was not very long ago the previous administration in the u s we really couldn't say much about climate change right you may some of you may remember that we certainly do but i think the idea here is whether you not you believe in climate change or not the fact is our reality what are we seeing on the ground and what we are seeing on the ground are changes in climate and we have to respond to that and so how are we going to respond to that and one of the ways to do that is to do that sustainability if we're asking our engineers i'm not an engineer i'm a, I'm a biologist okay but if we ask our engineers like 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 over here how can we enable you to innovate they need guidance they need documentation we got engineering manuals in the United States that are older, as old as some of you sitting in the audience. They need to be updated, okay? How can we enable them to incorporate working with nature in their projects to become more sustainable? And so what we're doing in the Army Corps of Engineers, and this was a five-year effort, we published the International Guidelines on Natural Nature-Based Features of Flood Risk Management. Five-year effort, over 170 authors, and over a thousand pages of, of guidance and information. No, I did not bring any copies with me, but I did bring the overview. I have a couple copies of the overview and I'm not taking those back with me. So if you're interested in receiving a copy of the overview, please come by and see me. This is the most important document that we published uh, in our history for engineering with nature that stood up in 2010. The idea is to enable our engineers and others to implement working with nature and engineering with nature in practice. I'm a biologist, I'm a research biologist. I am a researcher uh, by, by training and, and, and by advocation. So, but sometimes we have, to, I mentioned communication in the past, right? So sometimes when we need to communicate, we need to communicate in ways that we're not used to doing. So in this particular case, our leadership within the Army Corps of Engineers said, show us how we and others are implementing engineering with nature. And so you're not gonna hand that leader a technical document. It's not that he or she cannot understand it, they're not gonna have time. When they say, show me, they mean literally, show me. So what we started doing in 2018, and then again for volume two in 2021, we're actually publishing coffee table books. These are pictures and stories of completed projects, sustainable projects, incorporating working with nature and engineering with nature uh, in practice. Within the Army Corps of Engineers, we have the support to the highest levels of the Army Corps of Engineers. And so this is not some rogue engineers and scientists uh, working off to the side. So we have a lot of, uh, lot of support within the Corps uh, to uh, implement engineering with nature uh, broadly. So that leads me to my summary slide. Climate change offers both challenges. And so I'm arguing that offers opportunities. We have over a century of infrastructure in the United States. And so are, are we going to continue the conventional approaches to infrastructure? Are we going to continue business as usual in, in, in the face of a changing climate? Or are we going to take this as the opportunity to innovate and to grow and to learn from those lessons from the past and do better this time. I would argue that represents a great opportunity. Topic of sustainability is dynamic and rapidly evolving. Just I think the, the sheer number of sustainability related uh, technical uh, documents that have been published over time, they're very, very rapidly evolving. And so we need to make sure we understand where we fit in that broader sustainability uh, uh, discussion uh, worldwide. Sustainability is a cross-cutting theme. It's not just the Environmental Commission. It's just not the Permanent Task Group on Climate Change. This has impacts to recreation navigation, inland navigation, and maritime navigation. And I think we need to uh, see it uh, as such. Guideposts are out there for us. Let's not reinvent the wheel. The UN Sustainable Development Goals, I think they're out there. We've had the opportunity then to look at some of our dredging projects and make direct ties to those UN SDGs. We have done that and we have published that in practice. So if it's working very well for us, I think it'll work well for you as well. PIANC has the opportunity to build on its sustainability commitments, talking about that commitment to climate change in 2019, to standing up with the Permanent Task Group on Climate Change. 
the working with nature philosophy. We have an opportunity to build on that. So let's be organized, I think, from a society and organization perspective and what that means to us and how we are going to address sustainability going forward. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you today. I think we have time for a couple of questions, uh, but also realize I still have a couple of copies of the, overli uh, the overview of the guidelines there. So like I said, if you're interested in receiving a copy, uh, please let me know. Thank you. So, uh, any of you want to ask a, a question to Burton? Uh, one thing I didn't mention, and sorry I'm doing it now, those of you who are following us on uh, YouTube, you can put the question through in the comments. We will read them and uh, put them forward. Uh, well, nobody? Okay. Thank you, Burton. Well then, for uh, there it is. Okay. So for the second uh, presenter of this session, uh, we're going to call Eddie. First of all, let me do a short introduction. Well, Burton said he's uh, he's our secretary. He's the he's the man who does a lot of footwork because he has to be chasing us to to get everything ready for each of our en encounters. Uh, Eddie is also in the U.S. Corps of Engineers. He's a hydraulic engineer. He's one of us, <laughs> uh, and he's the regional technical specialist in the Mississippi Valley Division. And uh, well, uh, Eddie, the, the floor is yours. I back up. All right, well, thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to speak to you. I will say I feel like I'm at home with all the Major League Soccer jerseys around town, so I appreciate that. I, um, my son lives in an Argentina jersey, so the only time he takes it off is when we wash it, and that's a forced, uh, a forced thing. But uh, I'm going to talk about working with nature and navigable rivers. So as, as mentioned, I'm in the Mississippi Valley Division in the St. Louis District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and I'll show you a map, but I'm right smack in the middle of the country. So. 100, almost 100% of what I do is on, on inland rivers and our inland navigation system. Yep. So I'm going to touch on a couple of things. Here's the outline. I'm going to talk about a little bit about 176, just to give some perspective on, on some of the things I'm going to discuss. I'm going to get into a few case studies. These are, these are new case studies. I didn't want to repeat some of the stuff that's already in PINK literature. So I'm going to talk about a number of the projects that, that we're doing in the, on the Mississippi River in some of the engineering with nature proving grounds. And then if time allows, I'm gonna talk a little bit about working group 236, which as Burton had alluded to, is I think a very important working group to help, um, help us guide some of the, um, the countries, particularly here in, in South America that are trying to develop some inland navigation systems essentially from scratch. So here is, as you've seen, <clears throat> here's a copy of the guide for applying working with nature. You can download this, I believe, for free on the, the PNC website. And I know other people are going to touch on this as well, so I won't get too much into it. So just for some perspective, what are some of the basic steps of, of working with nature? You know, what are we talking about when we talk about a project that engages working with nature? Well, obviously, you're establishing the project needs and objectives, right? And as Burton talked about, this is something that has been very dynamic. For at least for hundreds of years, our project purpose has been solve the engineering problem. And we've done, at least in the U.S., we've done an incredible job of that at the expense of a lot of other potential benefits that we could have we um, gotten from these projects. 
you know, understand the environment, understand the system that you're working in. You know, how can we use natural river processes to help us achieve our engineering goals? You know, is it necessary to use so much hard structure when possibly we can use some type of environmental feature to still get those benefits? And therefore we're, and I'll talk about it later, but we're, you know, that's gonna help us with operation and maintenance, that's gonna help us with having a more sustainable project. So that's a, that's a very important one. Engage stakeholders. This is one that I, every time I say it, I feel like it's, it's obvious, but it's something that is incredibly important in understanding what stakeholders have an interest in your project, right? Saying, oh, I worked with one particular agency and I'm not taking other people into account, potential communities and things like that. That's not really working with your, with your stakeholders. So identifying who they are and who has an interest. You know, designing the project, building and implementing, and then monitoring, evaluating, and, and adapting. You know, that's, that's very important for us. Again, we're moving from the 100% su successful, no risk engineering project into more sustainable projects. And a lot of times they're gonna involve, they're gonna involve some, some adaptation. You know, we're not, none of us are gonna come up here and say that all of these solutions are something that you're gonna be able to build it and forget it and it's gonna work 100%. I just have this slide up here to show that although we present it as six steps, these are all intertwined, right? So we're we're talking, we're engaging with our partners from step one all the way to the end, and adapt, you know, coming up with a monitoring plan and how we're going to adapt and coming up with those strategies. So this is, you know, even though we go through it really nice and clean, it really is all a, a big intertwined series of of um, objectives. And then lastly, here on the background, <clears throat> you know, what makes a good navigation infrastructure project. And I know you saw this with Burton, but you know, again, it's really important for us to have the environmental component, the cultural component, the socio-political component, and the economics. They all need to be working together to help create a, tr create a good project. As I mentioned, the days of simply doing, going to an old dusty book and solving an engineering problem are over. All right, so here's some, some case studies on projects that I'm working on or projects in the region or in the proving ground here. And here's a map of, of what I'm talking about. You can see the, the United States. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm right there in, in the middle, there in, in Missouri. And we have a benefit because in the St. Louis district, we have both open river and we have a pooled reach, which is managed by locks and dams. So we're able to do a bunch of different measures and try a lot of different things under different, different conditions. But I will say that these are systems that we have been engineering and managing for hundreds of years in some cases. So these are, you know, different from 236 that I'm gonna talk about in a bit. This is really how can we take the existing infrastructure and tweak the way that we're doing business to help incorporate some of the, the benefits that I just spoke about. All right, first thing, stakeholder engagement. I can't hit this hard enough. This is something that is, I think, unique to what we do, but it's starting to be used more in the core. We literally take a diverse group of stakeholders, stick them on a barge, go down the river and talk about the projects that we're doing. This allows good open dialogue. It allows us to sit down, as you can see in, in the photos, and really go in and explain our projects. And it gives people a forum and an opportunity to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations so we can understand what do you wanna get out of the projects that we're doing? What can we do, what can we do differently, right? In a public meeting, maybe people don't wanna come and talk to you about stuff. They're afraid, they don't wanna make a big comment in a big group, but being able to pull you aside and say, hey, Eddie, that would be really great if you could do this, or hey, I've got this concern that I'm in this area that I've, I wanna make sure that you don't impact that. So it's incredibly important for our stakeholder holder engagement. So what are the things that we're doing? What am I talking about? Well, innovative river training. As I mentioned, you know, river training is something that we've done on navigable rivers around the world for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the, the US is, is no different. The engineering solution, the historic way we've done that is we've taken hard rock structures and we've used them to constrict the channel to give us additional depth, right? It's, very, it's incredibly simple and it's worked incredibly well, but you know what it also does? It also makes it a homogenous channel that has one habitat type, which is, well, two, structure and non-structure. 
So how are we? How have we gone in and, and modified the shapes that uh, that we have here, and and for our bank protection, and found ways to combine kind of our hard structure with some geomorphic processes that can reclaim some of those those habitat types. As you see here on the uh, on the left side, you know this is a, a sandbar that we've induced just through a couple of tweaks to the the structure elevation and shape that we're using. In the middle, this is simply going in and, and taking structures that we have and modifying those existing structures to allow flow through a notch in that, in that structure. And then on the last one, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. This is, and this is all these types of projects are also on the cover of Atlas number one. But um, this is just taking, adding a chevron shape to that, um, to that structure. And I'll get more into that, but that allows us to, to create some habitat types and some, some ephemeral sandbar habitat that we, that we usually don't have with our kind of traditional river engineering methods. Here again is, is some chevrons, the project that I worked on. You can see here how, again, we've got this kind of shifting sand and we've been able to create these bars. And this is a habitat type that we have lost previously when we build our, our traditional structures. Does it take, you know, does this take more coordination? Absolutely. Is it a little bit more expensive? It is obviously there's a little bit more more material here, but um, what you can see is it does we have, we're able to create this island mix that's more um, representative of what the river looked like before the the Corps of Engineers got in, involved. Hello. There we go. So here's, here's that project again where we created this really great island just through tweaking, tweaking some of the structures. And this island has a lot of benefits. Number one, we have more natural slopes. So we're seeing slopes on these islands that are more, more similar to what was there before we got engaged with river engineering. That's great for habitat benefits. We have um, a nice high sandbar that's disconnected from the, from the bank lines, which is great for, for birds and the least turn. And one thing that I, haven't mentioned, you can see here with the navigation channel, is that we're still maintaining navigation. We're still maintaining that, for us, it's a nine foot deep, 300 foot wide channel that we're required to maintain while being able to do some, some new and innovative things on, on the margins. And this project here has been a, a huge success. They've caught uh, a lot of diverse fish species and bird species while, uh, while maintaining navigation. Off bank revetment. This was something that's incredibly simple, right? If you have bank erosion, you put riprap on. You know, you go into the dusty old book, and you put a bunch of rock on it. And guess what? You don't have you don't have erosion anymore. You can't get any simpler than that. But what are you now creating? You're taking these natural bank lines, and you're turning them into essentially this rock habitat that is could not be any more different than what you what you started with naturally. So this is a, a concept in a and a method that we use where we'll take that material and we'll, instead of just placing rock on the bank line, we'll build um, our revetment offset. And what that does is that gives us the protection that we need on the banks, but it also allows the slack water habitat and the natural slopes to, uh, on, the, on the bank side of that. And we're seeing a lot of fish habitat where that we have low velocities. And that's a place, as, as you can imagine, when we're trying to increase our velocities to induce sediment transport, you know, obviously we have high velocities and that's bad for fish migrations. So any way that we can create this slack water habitat for fish to, to rest or fish to, to hide out, to, to eat, is, is always a benefit in these types of projects. You know, beneficial use, you're gonna hear so much about beneficial use now. And as, as Burton mentioned, this is a priority in the Corps of Engineers. And we've got the target of 70% beneficial use by, is that 2030? <clears throat> and so we're working really hard in the, in the St. Louis district on ways that we can have good, innovative, beneficial use that allows us to create habitats that have been lost in the, in the river. So you can see here, we've done everything from ephemeral bars. You can see on the top, the top left where we take a flexible dredge pipe. We put material here. And then when we get high water, that's gonna wash away. 
which is isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? You think back to to your lanes equation and when the um, lanes relationship and how when you have more water, your rivers want more sediment, so that it supplies that sediment to the river at the times that it's that it needs it. Um, we've also looked at, at projects where we have um, protected our beneficial use behind rock structures. There you can see um, within the chevron. You can cut me off when whenever. <clears throat> And here's some, some hydrographic surveys just kind of showing some of the beneficial use projects, one of the pilot projects that we did. So on the top left, you can see in the, in the dark green, you can see where we had the island that was in 2011. 2013, you can see that it's, you know, the green is, is less dark here. You can see the scale here. But um, you, know, you can see that that washed away a, a little bit. And then here by 2014, you can see that there's no, it, it's, the feature is completely gone like I had, like I had mentioned, you know, and then taking that, these pilot projects and having an understanding of, hey, how is this connected to the hydrograph? At what point do we start to see these washing away? And, you know, how sustainable are these? How long can we have these, these features out there? And it's these projects, Burton had talked about the need for guidance. And Engineering with Nature is very engaged now, taking things beyond the international guidelines and actually doing engineering guidance to help engineers out in the field have a place to go to say, hey, I want to do ephemeral islands. What do I need to do to do that? What are the engineering criteria for that? And it's pilot projects like this and the projects that we that we talked about earlier that are being used to, to feed into what this guidance looks like and understand what works, what doesn't work. And as, as we talk about a lot in, in the NNBF, you know, what scales and what doesn't scale to, right? An NNBF project that is not appropriate for the conditions is probably 100% gonna be, be a failure. So we need projects like this to understand and be able to identify. You know, island creation, this is a little bit of a combination of, of the two things that I just talked about. And it, the thing here is how can we use natural mechanisms natural mechanism for islands has been disrupted, right? We've closed off our islands that exist. We don't really have a way to do it. Our rivers are, are no longer meandering like they used to because the Corps of Engineers has locked them in place. So there's, unless there's an island now that we're sustaining, there's probably no way we're gonna get that back unless we have an absolutely catastrophic condition. I'm gonna talk about one that we almost had here in a second, but we know that, that, that islands are a very important habitat. I touched on that a second ago. So how, is there a way that we can combine the need for that channel constriction and the need for a navigation structure with the development and the creation of an island? And can we use natural processes to do that? So we're kind of going you know, forward to the past here, though. All right. And so we're looking at using the structures that if you know, if you've ever read up on the Missouri River system, or even the, the Mississippi River system, we used, you know, the way that we went about our engineering was to use pile structures. And what that did is that turned your, um, turned your water habitat essentially into floodplain. So our idea is, can we take those same principles, but instead of trying to create a new floodplain, can we use those to potentially create islands, to slow the water down, to induce deposition, and then get some potentially natural islands there. So this is a project that we're working on this year in the St. Louis district, we have a, pro a pilot project and our partners are extremely excited about it. And then the second question here is, can these types of sites be used as a beneficial use location where we can speed up some of these um, geomorphological processes and get those, get those islands? So stay tuned. Dr. Ben, this is a place where we almost had a catastrophic issue. This is um, a meander bend in the middle Mississippi River you can see on the left side, it is it's predominantly farming, and there's a levee that goes around it. On the right side, you can see the river channels because the levee broke, and because of economics, we were unable to re rebuild that levee. So <clears throat> the standard way the Corps would have gone about this, and as you can imagine, if we were to have a channel cutoff, that's going to change the river slope. Changing the river slope is going to change sediment transport, and we're going to have a potentially a head cup that, go, that goes upstream, and this would wreak havoc on our navigation system. So we don't want that, obviously.
But the way the Corps has worked in the past is we've got a catastrophic problem like that. What do we do? We throw a whole lot of money at it, and we make darn sure that that project is not going to fail. And this is a this is a place where, you know, doing the working with nature here was coordination and collaboration and working with partners and talking to partners and saying, hey, let's all get together and understand what everybody's needs are, what everybody's values are, what everybody can bring to the table, and what your plans are for this reach. So what we were able to do here is we were able to do some limited structure upstream to stop flow from going across the peninsula and then work with another agency that is um, that has easements, has purchased the land, and is um, they purchased that land and they're going to plant trees there. And then we could look at it from a risk standpoint and say, oh yeah, if we have all those trees, that's going to slow down the water, that's going to cause sediment to deposit, and that's going to reduce the risk of, act of having a channel cut off. So here the agency saved a lot of money because we didn't dump an enormous amount of rock, and now we have an incredibly rich environmental um, area here. And there's also a number of socioeconomic benefits for the community that they can now reap by having this, this natural location. How much time do I have left, Riley? Not very much. And lastly, here's environmental pool management. This is, you know, how can we input engineering with nature or working with nature principles into just how we manage the system, right? I talked about how we have navigation pools in the, in the upper Mississippi River. And so we, you know, we have a dam and we hold water back and that holding that water back gives them the depth that they need. But what we tried many years ago is, you know, what happens there is we inundate all of that great habitat on the, on the margins of, of the river because it's all underwater. So places where we used to have great vegetation that was used to help feed birds in the flyway, which is the Mississippi River is a, a great migratory flyway in the U.S. Now they don't, you know, they're losing that, um, that critical vegetation, that critical, critical food for them to complete their, their journey. So what we discovered is if we can just have a, have a drawdown of one foot or three feet and keep it there longer, and while still obviously maintaining our navigation depths, that's going to allow, as you can see on the right side, that's going to allow us to now have, have vegetation develop and sustain that vegetation for, for enough time for that to be beneficial to the, to the environment. And it's at no cost to navigation. We're still maintaining navigation. We're still giving them the depths that we're doing. We're just deviating from the, the dusty old book in the way that we've done things for, for many years. So up to this point, I've talked about a project, the Mississippi River, we've been engineering for a very, very, very long time. That's great, but what does this mean for potentially a country or a river system where there is no river engineering? We don't have a number of structures out there. You know, what can we learn there? So I'll talk about the Madeira River here in, in Brazil. And this was a project where um, Calvin Creech, who was the, the core guy in in Brazil, he brought the River Engineering Committee down, which is a, a group of experts in river engineering uh, that cuts across all different types of, of river engineering. We help solve problems for, for different districts. People come to us, and we, we go in, and we help give recommendations. And the vision was that we would get the River Engineering Committee down there. We would come up with a vision. We would give them all these great ideas that they can construct. They would do plans and specs, and then they could dump they could uh, invest a lot of money in this system that uh, was going to be maintenance free and a one time investment and you walk away and everything is perfect. Obviously, that would that was a failed plan to start with. But um, what ended up happening here on the Madeira is that, um, you know, we had all these all these engineering experts on there. And, and what ended up happening is we walked away and the recommendation was hold up. You do not want to do what we have done. You know, we need to take a step back. We need to find measures that potentially are more more temporary. Um, you know, how do you how do you manage in the in the U.S. As I mentioned, the Corps of Engineers has locked our river in. So how do you manage with permanent structures a river that is still, as you saw here in the in the image, a river that's still meandering, a river that's still moving, right? If we put a structure in here. Well, the river is just going to look at it, laugh, and, and move elsewhere. So what they're working on now, and I'm 
you know, Clay is in the he'll talk a little bit he's responsible for for this project. But you know, we looked at temporary structures that have have been used elsewhere in uh, in other in other countries, and how can we maybe address some of our repetitive locations by using using temporary structures that give us the um, oh my gosh that uh, I'm going to be the only one that has this problem. But um, <clears throat> how can we use temporary structures and also use the material that's found naturally in the river? You know, Madeira is, is wood, right, in Portuguese. So how can we utilize some of this wood that's out there and build temporary structures to help solve our dredging problems and tweak the system in locations that we, that we have navigation issues without fundamentally changing the river? You know, one thing that we've learned in the court in the U.S. is once you start, it's nearly impossible to stop, right? If we put a structure in, that's going to impact the local reach. It's also going to impact the reach downstream. We put another structure in to address that. Well, now it, it keeps moving and, and continues to be an issue. Last but not least, one of the things that we do very well in the core is make the same mistake over and over and over and over. And in our flood protection and our flood risk management, this is particularly true. We have a program as PLA 499, where if you're in our program, our federal program, and your levee breaks, guess what we do? We build it back. And we don't think about any other options. We just build it back. And guess what happens? It breaks again. And we build it back again. So um, on the Missouri River, it's been a very, my counterpart, David Crane, has done a lot of levee setback projects where they have come up with these plans and identified measures ahead before the flood so then when they do have a flood and the core comes in, we can say, whoa, 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 we have a plan here too. And we work with the landowners and we say, hey, you can give up this little bit of land that's been inundated time and time again. Well, this has all been inundated, but you can give up that little bit of land and that's going to lower water levels. That's going to create environmental benefit. We're going to have a brand new section of levee. And now we can almost we can ensure that you're going to have better protection for the rest of your property by giving up that little bit and, and restoring a lot of those natural processes. And that's something that um, that has been wildly successful. I know Burton has done. He talked about being a researcher. He's done a lot of research on this. And this is something that we continue to work on and find pilot projects and identify benefits so we can start pushing the Corps of Engineers into um, a mindset of Instead of throwing bad money at bad money, you know, new money at bad money and making the same bad decisions, maybe we can find and imagine a different way of, of doing business where we can lower flood risk and, and, reduce, uh, and reduce the impacts. I think that's probably all my time. But um, if it's not, I can touch on. Yeah, so this is Burton. had talked about it. I'll go through this real fast. Um, working group 236. You know, as I mentioned, we've been doing things in the U.S. for a very long time. What happens when, um, what guidance is out there for countries that are, are trying to develop a navigation system from scratch? And that's exactly what 236 is, is working on. You know, they're coming up with a classification of rivers. So you can have everything from a natural river to a you know, highly regulated river. And then propose what, uh, what types of improvements are appropriate for those types of systems. Um, <laughs> I can't wait to watch everybody else do this too, but um, <clears throat> you know, and then be able to say, hey, this is what you might do if you have um, an un, you know, an unconstrained river. This is what you do in the pools, and to really give that that understanding there, and with, with the focus on what you do when you're developing a new <laughs> a new process, and you know, navigation planning. There's tools out there and technology out there that we don't need to do the things we did back in the 1800s, right? We can survey, we can modify where our navigation channel is. We have aids for navigation. We can work and communicate with pilots. You know, maybe the, there's a dredging problem when our channel is here, but if we move it here, we don't have that dredging issue anymore. We don't have that navigation problem. You know, using technology can save us an enormous amount of money and um, reduce a lot of the, the impacts that we have. When I first started my career, I was told that you always need to end a presentation with a Mark Twain quote. So uh, that, that has continued 20 years um, to today. So here's a, a quote that reminds me that everything that I try to do day to day is 
the river is going to do what it wants anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Gerardo. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, any questions? Are there any questions? Uh, I don't know if there's one online. Okay, thank you again, Eddie. They're all taller on me. Okay, I'm. It's my turn now. I don't know if the presentation is. Oh, there it is. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Gerardo Besone. I'm uh, in the the chief of dredging and aids to navigation department here in the port of Bahia Blanca. Uh, I've been part of the port for the last uh, 12 years, and uh, also, as mentioned before, uh, since 2019. I am a delegate for uh, Argentina on MBCOM. And uh, since 2021, I had the pleasure also of being the rep for uh, Argentina uh, at uh, PTGCC. And uh, today I'm going to, well, present uh, some of the things that uh, um, Federico already said that are the challenges for us uh, and what's coming on. Let me see if it works there. There it is. Well, most of you present here know the estuary of Bahia Blanca. Let me just give a quick reference for those who are tuning in. Um, this is the estuary of Bahia Blanca. It has a uh, um, surface of some 2,400 square kilometers. Um, we we are located there in the in the red square uh, up above in the innermost pl portion of the estuary. Um, we share the estuary with other two important ports. On first the naval base, the Puerto Belgrano, which is the the biggest naval base of uh, Argentina. And also beside it, we've got uh, Puerto Rosales. Uh, the estuary has a, a main channel, which has a length today of uh, 97 kilometers and a width of uh, 190. And the minimum depth that we maintain today is 30 meters to the local zero. If we look upon the port of Bahia Blanca, this is uh, how it looks today. We have uh, around uh, 19 uh, operational piers and berth uh, today. And uh, we've, uh, well, last year we had a record of more than 31 million tons throughput uh, throughout the year. And, uh, well, one of the main characteristics of, of, of our port is uh, that. Uh, perhaps is one of the few ports in Argentina that has the possibility of ex expanding itself either to the west or to the east, and also well, also to the south. But that's not the best option. So as can you see, uh, we got the blue shaded areas are the lands that could be well be used for uh, future um, projects. Uh, well, this is just an artist impression of what would be the future of the port. First, uh, whoops. It's already happening, Eddie. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as you can see, we, we, we got these two large uh, extension of land to, to eradicate new projects. Uh, if need be. So we were talking about the need to adapt. 
uh, Bahia Blanca waterways. And uh, well, the reason is already spoiled. Uh, most of us uh, here in Argentina know very well what we're talking about when we talk about Paca Muerta. I think besides football and politics is one of the themes we most talk about. But for those uh, who are not uh, uh, common with it, uh, Baca Muerta is a formation of uh, non-conventional gas and oil. Uh, it is the fourth largest uh, um, reservoir of uh, non-conventional oil, and it's the second largest of uh, gas, with another uh, thing that is, it, it has shown, oops, Sorry about that. Yeah, it has shown uh, high productivity, which makes it uh, economically feasible. Uh, when we look at the pipe network of, uh, of for gas in in Argentina, we see the development, uh, the, and we place ourselves there in uh, in in the in, in this place here in, in Bahia Blanca. You see that we are in a crossroads of several of these major pipelines, which give us a, a, a very beneficial position to receive most of the production. There you can see in in orange is the new uh, the new pipeline that was just finished, the first stage uh, up to Salikelo. That comes directly from Baca Muerta and allows us to receive much of the production uh, here to uh, for export. And why are we talking of export? Well, uh, the provisions are that uh, in in a couple of years the production will rise and we will be able to have export uh, volume enough to attain what we need here for our local consumption and also have a substantial amount of uh, gas to export in the form of liquid natural gas. Likewise, uh, we have, uh, we have the, the same uh, possibility with oil. You see the, that is the oil pipeline that ends up in Puerto Rosales, here besides us, and uh, the possibility there is th of also being able to export the excess of production that is expected in the in the next few years. Uh, what you see below the, the picture is actually what it looks like a fracking. Uh, well, this is done by by fracking. The uh, how. Uh, um, the production is for the 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 getting the the, the oil, the shale oil, uh, which is completely different from what the conventional uh, oil wells used to look like. So, with this possibility of having so much uh, gas and oil to export, and being by Blanca in a in the best of position to actually be the the hub that will allow the the to receive this uh, this excess production and be able to to export it, we began receiving and we're working on several different projects related to this. On the one hand, well, you, you might have heard it, the uh, IPF Petronas, which has to been much talked about. Uh, and it it comes up to 30 million tons a year of LNG. Uh, for that, we are going to need also a substantial uh, surface to develop the facilities uh, um, in the ground and also a possibility of building a future complex of a petrochemical complex uh, besides it for the downstream of, of, uh, of the gas. Uh, another gas project that is on is on the line is um, the TGS, much more of the same thing. This will be also to process the gas uh, and liquefy it for it to be sent by by ship. 
the idea is to place these on the western side of the of the um, uh, of the uh, Bahia Blanca uh, port. Uh, those would require some land reclamation because the land is actually not there. Uh, also, we have going to oil production. We have a uh, Trafigura, which is already prepping for uh, um, starting to do expo of, uh, of shale oil from our Pier 3, which is already built. But we would have to uh, change the the shape and the and the depth of the of the pier in order to be able to receive um, the new ships. And uh, as I said before, uh, uh, Puerto Rosales is going to be receiving the end of the pipe that comes from uh, Baca Muerta. There is uh, also a, a project to which is already started uh, to build a new pier which will uh, be able to receive Aframax and even Suez Max uh, tanker and with a planned maximum throughput of up to 15 million tons per year. Well, all of these projects have one thing in common and that is that they're going to require that bigger ships come into our system. Uh, we talked about the Aframax tanker, we talked about also the Suez tanker, but we will surely receive also Qflex uh, gas uh, carriers. Uh, I uh, put in, in black uh, the certain uh, dimensions which are I want to point out. Um, first of all, we're going to, as I said, when you started today, the, the maximum draft that we can uh, operate is uh, up to 13.7 meters. These uh, carriers will, will need 15.5. Uh, also, the beam, today we, we're working mainly with Panamax, which is 32.4 meters wide. We have to go to, to 50 meters. And in the case of the Qflex, well, uh, much larger than what we usually receive here. It's up to 315 meters. So what do, does that mean? Uh, that we'll have to adapt the channel design. Oh, sorry. There you go. There's been much talk done up to now about dredging. So I'm going to just prompt a question for you here and 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 uh, online what do you understand for dredging uh, and uh, let me give you just a uh, small help uh, oops there it goes there i looked up in uh, in the dictionary and uh, i was frankly first i uh, looked at the cambridge dictionary cambridge they invented the language. <laughs> and, uh, and it says, to remove unwanted things from the bottom of the river lakes and uh, using a boat or special device. And the, uh, it didn't ring the bell, the unwanted things. So uh, I did a, a bit more digging and I, I came upon the NOAA definition that I do believe does fairness to, to the activity. And it talks about removing sediments. It talks about also that these sediments are the, a, a natural process. And it talks about, uh, well, actually, that you do it everywhere. Uh, that is an activity that's done all over the world. Uh, so I wanted to, to pose another question to you all. The what connotation do you perceive when you or you do you associate with 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 dredging? And uh, I want to ask you to hold that thought for for a bit. Let me explain myself a few minutes more and see if it if it changes. When we were talking about uh, the challenges, uh, we specifically 
uh, talk about the environment we are in and how challenging it is to ourselves. If we look there, here we, we have the, uh, this uh, zones are protected areas that uh, because we have the, well, we, we have the advantage that the estuary is very, very, uh, well, rich on wildlife and, uh, and the natural environment uh, here, we, we did yesterday a small, uh, a, a small sailing with, with, with the guys from MBCOM and we could see how many birds there are uh, the, and actually how much life there is in the, in the estuary. So that this poses a, a challenge to, to proceed. Uh, we got the natural reserve of uh, White Bay, uh, False Bay and, and Green Bay. This is a huge natural re reserve of up to 2,600 kilometers, square kilometers. Uh, the particular thing here is if you look at the northern uh, frontier of this uh, reserve, it goes right next to where our main channel now runs. So we're sitting next to a natural reserve. And if this happens for about 45 kilometers. So this on the one hand, and uh, the second one is uh, what we have here in front of us, right in front of us, this is the natural reserve of the uh, sand crab uh, seagull that uh, runs for uh, uh, most of the, of the, of the front of the of the port uh this is a newer uh, natural reserve uh we have uh, worked with uh, with the ministry of uh, of environment uh to set it up um we have a, a small buffer zone left for the ports to actually uh be able to develop the the southern side but uh well it does pose uh, another challenge when we have to inter intervene in, in in that area. I would I I don't think you can see it. Well, no, perhaps not. The the um, this national reserve is named because of an island. Uh, the sea see the sand crab uh, seagull island, and actually that island, uh, much of it was uh, made. Uh, during the last uh, capital dredge that was uh, that was made back in the in the 90s, beginning of the 90s, much of the leftover material was casted uh, in that place. Uh, if you if you want, you can see the satellite uh, image where you can clearly see several straight lines in, in, on that island, which are the trenches of where the pipelines used to be where the cutter such a dredger uh, casted the material. So actually, before actually thinking of beneficial use and uh, being uh, adamant about it, well, we, we got their material that afterwards turned out to be a perfect nesting place for, for the seagull. And in time, it turned out to be a, um, a natural reserve. Oh, sorry. Um, Burton and Eddie have been talking about uh, some of the guidelines that Pianc has to the sustainable development. I'm just going to pass through them lightly. 176 and 214 is already being mentioned. I want to just point out one which is ongoing and uh, uh, that is very relevant for us, uh, and I have the pleasure of being a part of the of the work group. That has to do with uh, dredging and specifically when and how to dredge. Uh, that is uh, in order to take into account the different possibilities that will en enable it to be more sustainable. Uh, it is an ongoing uh, work and. As Burton said, we set out to be ready in a couple of months. It's been already a couple of years, and we hopefully, perhaps next year, we have uh, news on this on this uh, guideline. And uh, 
we were talking about working with nature. Well, we've been working with nature all along here in the port of Bahia Blanca because one of, of the main characteristics we have is a uh, great a tidal amplitude. Uh, in the port area is more than four meters. On the channel is around two and a half meters. So this gives us the possibility of using the tide in order to operate in a way that the ships mount on the on the tide so they have uh, a, um, a bigger clearance and uh, are able to cast off with with higher draft than actually what the channel is dredged for so uh, this has been going on uh, since we started and our guys here in, in bts uh, are the ones who, who are, op are operating this uh, this system this windows in order to uh, to be able to maximize the use of of the tide in order to to get uh well uh boat uh, ships with uh, with larger draft to be able to cast off from from the port and uh also we talk a lot about uh, what is uh, the well the beneficial use of 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 the uh, of of sediments. Well, we we're talking also of expansion. Well, here is a, a possible uh, expansion project, which will require obviously to dredge a new channel, a long load channel, and also a turning basin. All of that material could be used first as, as a landfill and also uh, because not all of the material will be uh, good enough to use right away, what you can do is prepare an, air, an area, which is now shaded in, in orange, to dump that material there and uh, because it's not going to be used in the short run, allow for the natural process of, of consolidation to take place in order to be ready for future use. So on the short term, we use the good material in the landfill. On the long run, we use uh, the leftover material or the, or the not so good material on this uh, dump site, which is al already going to be prepared and in a, in, a, in, a, in a place where we could use it afterwards. And uh, how to achieve uh, a sustainable um, waterway. First of all, you need, uh, oops, there it goes, to gather data. That is paramount for any project to, to be feasible. And you have to be doing it from long before you start doing the, the project. As long as you have a good, reliable um, information, the quality of the of the project will be much much greater. So we've been doing that. We still have to obviously we have to step up things, but we have tides, we 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 have wave, wind and current. We need to to get more, as I said, and also well there you got the uh, the boy that Yado has uh, developed. We have three of them, which are also gathering temperature, oxygen, turbidity, and salinity, etc. And one other thing which is uh, important for, for us is to have periodic detailed bathymetric surveys because the system in which we are in is highly uh, changeable through time. And um, bathymetries can allow us to know where and how the sediments are settled and if there are morphologic movements also related to the, the bed. Yeah. Oh, obviously, one thing is uh, to perform periodic also controls of uh, sediments and water. All the, the dredging we're doing now is maintenance, mm, but also that dredging is you have to get uh, an environmental license to do it. And this license come with a management plan that you have to approve with, with the Ministry of the Environment here in, in the province of Buenos Aires. 
and that uh, prompts you to do uh, um, um, sampling all over the the, the, the area that is uh, affected uh, with dredging. The number of sample and the the quantity of sample is already set by by uh, by normative, so we have to apply to that. And obviously, if we are going to think of uh, expanding our our channel, uh, we are going to have to change. And obviously, that will uh, require more and perhaps uh, in newer sites and, and in newer areas. And when we come to tools, uh, well, today nobody thinks of uh, working without uh, numeric models, that is hydrodynamic, uh, also maneuver models and uh, sedimentation models. Hydrodynamics are, uh, well, the basis of everything, and uh, that's why we need so much data gathering and, and also to have it uh, updated all the time. Uh, when I began my my uh, well my first job was actually in a consultant and I did a lot of modeling with with Mike 21 DH high Mike 21 and so forth and uh, my mentor back then told me one thing which is true the models are fantastic but the results you get is are as good as the data you put into them so the that's why we 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 make such a, a um, a big deal about gathering data. Um, and also, well, when we look at uh, maneuver models, they, although Piank has uh, marvelous, uh, I believe is one for one, the work group that uh, has the design of uh, channels uh, that we all used, well, that, uh, that is just uh, a guideline. Uh, but we, with this type of, of projects, we, we need to face up and go to uh, uh, modeling to see how actually the, the ships will perform and in that way being able to get the design and the shape of the of the channel uh, which is most fitted for each of the of the ships and uh, also I talked about sedimentation sedimentation models then are the key to providing us the the possibility of knowing how sustainable our uh, our channel is, and uh, Eddie mentioned that perhaps sometimes you need to shift a bit the the channel. Well, he, here's the same thing: if we have a very good sedimentation model, a very good uh, hydrodynamic mo model, we can actually predict what the maintenance is going to be, and therefore work with different alternatives in order to get the best. Uh, solution possible and uh, another way of actually getting more draft without dredging is uh, well dynamic underkill clearance um, there are already commercial software that allow you to assess the dynamic underkill clearance uh, strictly speaking this means that uh, for instance, today, by regulation, we need to maintain an underkill clearance equivalent to 10% of the draft. And it doesn't matter whether you have a perfect day without any waves, or if you have the wave limit almost to being, uh, to having to close the, the, the port. And that means that uh, with this, possibility of using the dynamic on the kill clearance, we could gain several feet uh, without uh, actually the need of, of, of dredging. Um, and uh, well, I, I, I'm going to speed up a bit. Uh, we have to be ready for what's coming uh, because we don't know exactly when it's going to be. So as, as I said, we, we need to update our information and all the, the data we're covering. We need to develop as soon as possible, not ourselves, but uh, have developed uh, models that can allow us to, uh, to do the project and uh, to have these scenarios being uh, predictive scenarios run. 
Also, uh, we have to do a very uh, thorough environmental analysis of the areas which are likely to be uh, to be used in the future, and that may need the, an action plan to reduce or to mitigate or even to remediate some possible impact of uh, of the of the project. And uh, well. Jumping into the conclusions, we are going to need an EPA channel that is almost must. Uh, let me see. No. It has to be sustainable in, a, in every way. Burton has shown that what sustainability is. It's environment, it's economics, it's society, everything put together. We have guidelines that Clean Pianc is already uh, issuing. And I know that uh, Rene of EIDC is not going to be <laughs> with me on this, but uh, obviously the goal is to dredge as less as possible. Although, as I said, the connotation perhaps of dredging is by the public is, is bad. Uh, we have to see that dredging is a means to an end. That is, we need to move the, the material to have deeper channels to allow for our future. So thank you very much. And I don't know if, if you have any. Sorry. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> yes. You can do it in Spanish. Uh, they're going to translate it. Ahí me escuchan mejor. Perfecto. Eh, no, mi pregunta era eh, si habían considerado eh, usar el, el refulado del, del dragado eh, para, para también un beneficio ambiental. Eh, no solamente para ganar eh, hábitat, como contaban en, en la charla anterior, sino sobre todo para tratar de evitar un poco la, la erosión que está ocurriendo en el estuario. Eh, mi pregunta va más que nada relacionada a, al potencial que podría llegar a tener el estuario para retener dióxido de carbono y tratar de compensar las, las emisiones. Eh, y si bien a, al día de hoy no sabemos muy bien qué está pasando en el estuario y cómo cómo puede funcionar en ese, en ese sentido. Eh, sí sabemos que se está perdiendo mucho material rico en carbono, en carbono muy antiguo, de más de 5.000 años, eh, y tal vez esto, eh, digamos, el, el material que estamos retirando con el dragado puede ser una oportunidad para tratar de, de maximizar el, eh, lo que puede retener el estuario de, de dióxido de carbono. I'm going to uh, answer in English, if you don't mind. Um, of course. Uh, you have to look at this uh, from the perspective of uh, what is feasible to do with the dredge material. What, what you're mentioning uh, would be to, I, I gather, to, to do like an island or something like that with, with the material we, we're dredging. You have to take into account that what we do is what we, we dredge along a very large uh, of, uh, of the channel. And the quantity of material you actually get from uh, this uh, dredging is, is not that much. Uh, we have to take into account perhaps that today we're, we're looking at uh, uh, going to a channel that is going to have 40 kilometers more than what we have today. And those 40 kilometers account for uh, perhaps about eight or nine million cubic meters. The problem with that is if you have to move that material and the, the, the dredging is going to be done with, with a system called trail suction hopper dredge. That is, you scrape the bottom material, you put it in, in, the, in the ship in, 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 its, uh, in its hole, you navigate it and you, and you dump it. The problem is that the dump site for it to be feasible to carry out, the dump site has to be near to the place where you actually are dredging. And because of the, I don't know if I can go back to, oh, 
Well, if you see the, the layout of the channel, actually what you have is as further you go out, the further the, the both of the coasts are from, it's like we're going in, in, in the center line, yes? So actually, if you, if you wanted to do an island outside, first it would be a problem because the amount of, of, of sediment you, you would need to displace to that place would be huge because we're talking uh, about that the depth, the natural depth besides this new channel is already 12, 30 meters. So you had to do a, a, a land reclamation of at least 20 meters and that's, uh, that's impossible to do uh, actually. I, I, was, I was thinking more uh, in some kind of structures that uh, show, uh, that was shown in the previous talk. Yeah. Well, those type of structure are for places that are pretty much constrained on both sides. You're not so wide. If you look at, uh, at our, uh, um, well, actually, if you go sailing there, you won't be able to see the coast. So for you, it would be like you're, you're dredging in the middle of the sea. Uh, and that is the, 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 the reason why. And another thing is we have to do the, the dump sites the, the close to the, the, mm, the dredging area also to uh, to be maximize the the turnaround time of the cycles of of, of uh, dredging not only because that is going to be cost effective but also which means less carbon emission of the dredger while it's working because it will be more effective the work it does if you have to sail a lot of, of uh, many kilometers to actually get to a dump site that is nearer to the coast and, and you can and you can do this uh, this type of, of island. Uh, first, it would be impossible from the economic side because perhaps what you get uh, production in a, in a day will drop drastically. And on the other hand, you're going to have uh, a lot of emissions of the dredger itself uh, well, while it's sailing without actually doing any work. So you, you do have to, that's why we're thinking uh, doing that type of reclamation and uh, here where where it's easy to 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 cast the material or to or, or to uh, dump the material nearby okay. i don't know if it's uh, okay yeah yeah thank you very much okay acá tenemos otra pregunta de youtube de carlos castillo de perú el consulta me agradaría conocer ¿Cómo medir los volúmenes de sedimentos en las zonas de estuarios o deltas de río en lluvias no clínicas extraordinarias? I'm going to... Uh, uh, well, the best way to measure volume is do a survey. Do a survey before and do the survey after. Because that's the only way you can actually have uh, comparative uh, volumes uh, taken. So, if you do, uh, as I said, if you do periodical surveys in, in the places you're interested in, you can actually then measure what happens through time. Uh, and if you have a special event like uh, he was mentioning, if you do a survey right after the, the event, you, can, you will be able to determine what happened before and after and, uh, and obviously get the, the volume uh, required there. Other? Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much again. And uh, that's it for the first session. So I invite you to uh, coffee break. This okay. And uh, yes. Hey, Gerardo, can we have a, a, a brief uh, ceremony here? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that will be uh, for, um, for Victor and I and you. Oh, okay. <laughs> We wanted to share just a couple of things uh, with you in terms of our appreciation for how the, all the hard effort and, and time that went into uh, developing all the activities this week and, and for hosting our working groups. And so we wanted to give you a couple of things uh, as a token of our appreciation uh, for all that hard work. Uh, one, one of them is edible and the other one uh, is readable. Thank you. <laughs> Chocolates. Uh, uh, I'll eat while Yes, that, uh, that's the great combination. Now, I, I did not bring you the thousand-page version. 
So that would be a lot of eating of chocolate. But this is a shorter 70-page uh, overview. And so I, I wanted to, to share that with you again. From, from yeah. yeah. And like you, like Dr. Lee said before, I want to say a lot to you, Ricky. Thank you all for coming over. I know it's really snow. Yeah, when we saw you pointing, I switched automatically, so don't worry about that. Yeah, but it's usually where we are, over there, yeah. It is, but we have a LED screen. So red with red, you won't see anything.
para que llegue el puntero. Eso es lo que viste que le había comentado ayer al chico. Se lo comento de nuevo. apuntando para allá también listo
No, that's Burton. Hey, Burton, you're, is that yours? Your back? No, that must be Gerardo. He's probably just a couple lines right there. Yeah, no. Got it. So, um, Tiago, sorry. Tiago? Tiago? Tiago. It's your turn to be there <laughs> in front. Okay, now um, we're back uh, to begin the second session of the of the day. Uh, this session is also for with uh, MBCOM, and it's uh, MBCOM working groups and young professional addressing environmental challenges. Uh, first of all, we we're going to have a uh, um, Victor Victor Maga. Let me just uh, introduce you just just a bit. Oh, oh, better do the introduction yourself. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, everyone, well, uh, I'll give you the floor to you. Uh, ah, just one thing. You have to point. Yeah, that is it. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Yeah, thank you very much for being here and it is really a pleasure uh, to be able to speak to you all today. Thank you again to Gerardo. Um, thank you to uh, Claudia who is translating for us and maybe has, uh, we've learned the hardest job today, translating for um, I think what will be uh, about 10 hours or eight hours straight. So uh, much appreciated. Uh, I will talk about um, sediment beneficial use today. So this is a, uh, a, a, a very uh, important platform of PIANC. We prepared uh, a document that you heard about from Burton and from uh, Gerardo and others about uh, sediment beneficial use, and it was just published in spring. And for those of you who are PIANC members, Again, you can access this. I believe you can access this for free as a PIANC member. So, um, and I'll talk about that and some of the uh, visions that we have for sediment beneficial use. The next slide. Oh, that's me. Okay. If that works. See? There we are. Okay. Uh, so, our document was titled Beneficial Use for Sustainable Waterborne Transport uh, Infrastructure Projects. We were really focused on uh, sediment beneficial use. There's many types of dredging. There's many uses of dredging. But in the waterborne and transport sector where we are worried about uh, navigation channels, ports, managing sediment, this was really the primary focus of, of what we were interested in. And you can see a little bit about the publication here. Um, we had, uh, so the working groups for PIANC are international working groups. We bring together, we put out a call um, based on a terms of reference and um, you, people will respond to that terms of reference and we look for experts from different countries. We don't necessarily know the people beforehand, they all come together collectively and sit in a room and start to work out what do we want this document to be about? What does this mean to us? Um, uh, the Environmental Commission will review the applicants from the different countries to make sure that they're well suited for this. And usually we try and pick one person, maybe two from a particular country. So you can see a, quite a range of, of uh, representation, fairly heavy re representation in Europe, which is 
typical because Pianc is headquartered in Europe and that's where we get a lot of um, a lot of interest. But we have people from Australia, um, Japan as well. Uh, we looked for and didn't unfortunately have anyone from South America, but I think now with our stronger connection to Argentina, we'll work even harder to try and see that we can get that kind of representation and, and encourage people here who see these terms of reference go out um, as a call for people to join, that you think about joining a working group if you have that expertise and want to learn from others and experience this. I, I have found it very enriching. Um, I was the chair of this working group. Burton was our mentor who helped guide us through the PIANC process. Um, so when we think of beneficial use, we have a variety of different things that, are, that we um, encounter. So we are basically dredging large volumes of sediment and thinking, what do we do with that? Uh, in the past, we have moved that sediment offshore and disposed of it into the ocean. There are a lot of limitations holding us back from being able to do that or perhaps we would put it into lakes or um, in a variety of uses. And so we're trying to think of how we might be able to use this material more to our social and environmental advantage. We can think of beach nourishment when beaches get um, have sediment loss, sand loss uh, during storm events, construction, um, land development, island restoration, uh, agriculture. Some, some sediment ha is, has very high nutrient value and may be used uh, for, as fertilizer for agriculture um, and shoreline stabilization. And we were very interested. We had a beautiful tour of the port. Uh, thank you again, Sir George, for that tour. And we saw a lot of the wetlands. And we learned that one of the dredging techniques you have here is uh, injection dredging. You just push the sediment out of the way. And because it's, uh, um, they're such fines that the fines tend to distribute away from the channel. Um, Burton had the thought, and I thought we had a discussion about that that also could be seen as beneficial use. We have a saying in the U.S. or in, Ameri in, in English that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, beneficial use is also in the eye of the beholder. Sometimes it is really the way that you are seeing the benefit to society or the benefit to the environment that could make a project uh, uh, perform in the use of that sediment uh, beneficial to the environment and to society. So in this case, that sediment is staying in the resource. It's actually moving out to the wetlands and it's becoming part of that habitat. So I thought that was uh, um, something that we should really think more expansively about uh, ways that we might realize beneficial use. Um, some of our goals then are to restore habitat. Uh, we are working in, in a much more managed environment in the world. Um, this, this area is not heavily developed, but in many of the areas we work in, we have, it's so heav heavily developed that we have very few wetlands left. So we try and preserve them and try and expand and have more habitat. Um, buffers to help protect the environment so we can buffer from storms, not unlike some of the islands that you have um, just offshore. Um, providing access for the public to enjoy and recreation or for tourism as well. Um, and then also protection of threatened and endangered species. So these are many of the restoration goals that we have. And when we're managing large volumes of sediment, we have this resource of what we think is a valuable material that could be used um, for, to meet any of these goals. Um, flood management is very central to what we're doing. And we're always trying to think of how do we manage um, flood conditions. So on the left-hand side, we see a hardened structure. Um, and that, that also is very functional. Um, on the right, we see some flooding that might happen. And we are looking at maybe more natural for ways that we can try and manage some of these conditions. On the right, this is an area that I, my team is working on uh, in Long Island in the US that was inundated from Superstorm San Sandy, a very big storm that hit the United States. Um, and you can see all the flooding. So one of the techniques we're using is to, we call managed retreat. And we're asking homeowners to, we're buying up homes, or we, the, the, the county is buying up these homes and they are asking people to move back away from the flood pr prone area. I think we will see much more of this. It's very difficult, it's controversial. People don't like le leaving their homes. But on the other hand, 
uh, I think as Eddie talked about, may maybe making the same mistake again and again, we also can't really manage some of these flood prone areas when with climate change. Um, but when we are managing sediment, sediment can be a function for all of these. It can help um, when we are moving people back, we are also finding beneficial uses for sediment to recover some of that area in that picture that I showed you to restore that um, as a functioning wetland. Uh, we are creating elevated areas like you see in the middle picture, the uh, what we call hammocks. These are areas that have um, that are going to help reduce some of the energy of waves um, and impacts from, from flood events. And we are creating more meandering streams or more complexity um, in the wetland environment that slows down the movement of water. We don't always prevent all the flooding. Water it has an incredible way of finding its way into different areas, finding its way around structures, but we can slow down some of the energy and some of the damage that happens um, very often with a, a thoughtful and proactive use of uh, dredge sediment. And so here is a, um, an example that we, where a lot of dredge sediment is, is being placed, and this is for some offshore islands, uh, um, island structures that can help dissipate some of the energy of storms and waves that are coming in onshore. And uh, they are dynamic. They may often require constant maintenance. Um, we find ourselves often challenged with the thinking of, uh, is it worth building these and maintaining them or building very big rock jetties or these big rock structures that are perhaps more permanent, but also don't provide much habitat value. So something like this has to be thought of as uh, a living um, environment that may need continuous maintenance. But for areas that require continuous dredging, this could be a very complementary approach to dredge management. Um, so I'm moving now to from the concept of beneficial use and why we are trying to use benefic um, sediment beneficially to perhaps thinking about the economics. And we heard about uh, Working Group 195. This was a, um, a guidance document that has recently come out on ecosystem services. Ecosystem services is simply a term, a term of art that we use to describe the valuation of the ecosystem and the services they provide to the environment and to human beings. So if we can quantify those effectively, then we can start to bring value or measure that value against just the capital cost of doing the work. And we're often challenged when we look at sediment beneficial use that we might hear that the beneficial use alternative is more expensive than simply disposing of it the way we have been for the last 20 or 40 years. Um, the the um, the operation as usual uh, approach that that Burton talked about this morning, um, and so we want to try and find ways that we can show that value to our stakeholders and to our project owners. And we use ecosystem services, and we look at how all the different services that those can provide. And there are a lot of economic uh, tools and models that we can use to quantify those. So. I don't go into this in a lot of detail, but I really encourage you to think more expansively about your projects so that you can find the, the greater value that they may provide rather than just looking at the capital cost of the work itself. Um, and this might be realized in a graph uh, like this, where <coughs> the red uh, or orange lines show the cost, the capital costs uh, that you are expending. Those are some negative imp costs, and those are balanced against the return of the investment, which is in blue. And some of that return can last decades, if not endlessly. We, have, we will see, we have examples of islands that have formed um, that are very rich and doing really well, and there's uh, little reason to think that they would ever subside or, or lose value. So. You just have that return value that's coming to, right, whether it's monetized as tourism or monetized simply to the benefit of the environment or perhaps helping fisheries or other, um, other uh, benefits that you can measure. Um, we heard about the sediment, uh, the UN sustainability goals from Burton this morning. So there are some really specific 
um, goals that beneficial use really can satisfy. I really like that Burton said, virtually any one of the goals can be met when we think about set management, so we can look at them all expansively. But we have highlighted some that are really attuned more to sediment beneficial use. Again, this is a lot of our, our guidance was in helping find justifications, find uh, help the reader bring value for the use of sediment, um, partly because I think as Gerardo talked about, what is your perception of dredging? There's a lot of public sentiment that dredging is dirty, that dredge material is a waste material, that it needs to be, that, that it has lots of contamination and it cannot be reused. And more often than not, that is not the case. Um, there certainly is dredge sediment that has contamination, but well over 90% of the material that we dredge in the US, what Burton talked about, the 200 million cubic meters or more per year is not contaminated and can find beneficial use. And so we wanna try and encourage this, this use and more thoughtful approach to how that material is managed. So I'll go into just a couple, uh, a few examples um, this is a project that was done in the United States by um, my team for looking at uh, the coast along Lake Ontario. So the coast along Lake Ontario in the bottom half where you see all of the projects highlighted, uh, this is all, this is the, the US side, and then this is the Canadian side. So we worked just on the southern side on the US side and we did a very in-depth survey of the coast. We looked at kinds of projects, the flood damage that was caused it being that that was seen and and some of the needs to protect what we would call assets, to protect uh, infrastructure, uh, protect homes, um, protect uh, public uh, um, right of public uses. And, uh, and so then we ended up with a variety of projects and we narrowed those down. So there were about 200, 250 projects or more, but we narrowed it down quite substantially. Um, we uh, actually implemented many of those projects to remove some sediment, to do some dredging, to create some habitat. Um, and this is a very brief summary. We ended up with uh, beach nourishment. We ended up with littoral habitat. That's a shoreline habitat enrichment. Um, open lake placement in some cases, um, upland uses of the sediment and a variety of sediment beneficial uses. In this case, about 17 projects and about 50,000 cubic meters. Not a lot, but it's a lot for that community. This was a very, you know, th th this is a very different area than the 3 million cubic meters you might be seeing dredged here, but it brought a lot of value. And one of the most important parts of this project was the depth of community involvement. So we had many community meetings and the community was involved at virtually every stage of this process. It was their communities that we were trying to help protect. Um, another project, a much larger project, perhaps consistent with the volumes that we see at this port was the Port of Kokola. This is a project that my company Ramble in Finland had uh, managed. In this case, they were dredging about 2 million cubic meters of material. Um, and the port had made a commitment to 100% reuse or beneficial use of that material. They wanted zero material that was just dumped offshore. Um, and we heard about, so we have goals that are extending our beneficial use. Right now in the US, we reuse about 35% of that 200 million cubic meters of material. And the US Army Corps of, goal of, Corps of Engineers has established a goal that we heard from Eddie today, that we will go to 70% of material will be used beneficially, and that 70% would be met by 2030. The challenge here is that we, the 35% is what we call low hanging fruit, the stuff that's easy to pick off the tree. The, the difference between 35% to 70% is now coming to be challenged by the much more difficult projects, maybe more expensive projects, or complex uses of sediment. And I think this was a really good example of moving in that direction because the port made a very uh, proactive and public commitment to that 100% beneficial use of this 2 million cubic meters, which is a lot of material to manage. 
And what you see in many of these different colored and the boxes are different fill areas and each is gonna have, so there was an opportunity for port expansion. Not all of this is being used for habitat. There is off-site, and we don't see it, a lot of habitat protection. There's actually a natural preserve, and some of the material was able to be used for that benefit as well. Um, but uh, with the port expansion and with the need for land, um, they were able to stabilize the material and uh, see all of it come to some beneficial use. Um, and so these are some of the numbers. Uh, 10% of the material was contaminated. That underwent stabilization with uh, Portland cement. Uh, the, um, they had some blast rock that provided that was used structurally. Uh, they had um, they had some UXO that's un uh, unexploded ordnance material. This is in Europe, so many countries in Europe are dealing have to deal with U UXO that comes even from World War II. Um, unexploded bombs was put onto a small island uh, that was seen. Here on number six, and it's called uh, Homasari Island, which is in translated as Bomb Island. Um, so they were they were uh, not very creative in their naming, but it it certainly described the need. Um, and then the last example is comes from the Port of Portland. This was a project that was awarded the best uh, um, uh, the best uh, engineering with nature project at the last Congress, the last World Congress for Bianc. Um, in this case, the Port of Oakland in California reused material to create um, this new habitat area so that you see all inside this waterway here. Habitat, new shoreline. Um, it's it's a beautiful area to visit. It has recreational value for the public. They can come in. They're right next to the port, but it's also very pretty in the in the uh, San Francisco San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and we just see uh, I'm having the same problems now, Bernie. So. Uh, some pictures before and after that gives you an idea of kind of some of the changes um, that occurred. Um, <clears throat> so we want to really consider and work with public stakeholders, consider the social, sustainable, environmental impacts, the reasons for beneficial use. Um, we want to think more expansively than just dredge material and, and disposal, but want to try and find Dredge material, dredging can be um, bring more benefits to the environment than simply adding uh, navigation. Um, we want to engage public par uh, private partnerships, um, develop and implement long term management plans for and think really very far in the future when we're looking at dredging and beneficial use and use ecosystem services or ways to quantify the value that we're getting, that society is getting more than just being able to improve shipping conditions. Um, so thank you very much um, for your time, and um, and I'm wel I welcome questions if I have time. Um, I think I have a few minutes. Yeah, okay. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. Well, I'm the short one. All of them are taller than me. <laughs> okay. So, for our second speaker of the session, uh, we've got uh, Clay McCoy. Uh, Clay McCoy is the field program manager for the US Army Corps of Engineers and the mobile district works in Brasilia. Uh, he specializes in navigation and flood risk management with over 20 years of experience in coastal and riverine engineering, navigation, sediment dynamics, dredging, and hydrographic surveying. He currently supports partnership with Brazilian National Department of Infrastructure and Transportation and the National Water Agency 
and the National Waterway Transportation Agency, focusing on the knowledge of transfer of the capacity of the building of the river engineering and water resources. So, welcome, Clay. The floor is yours. Thank you. Am I the right height? <laughs> oh, no, I'm a little bit tall. There we go. All right. So I am Clay McCoy, and I'm the program manager in Brazil. But today, I'm going to talk about my previous job. Um, I've been in the Brazil for about 20 months. Um, but before that, I was the technical director of the Regional Sediment Management Regional Center of Expertise. Uh -oh. Is it going to click through the PDF, or do you need to just go down? Okay. All right. So, um, like I said, Regional Sediment Management, Regional Center of Expertise. And so that is in the South Atlantic Division of the Corps of Engineers. And I believe we have, or is it seven or eight divisions? Uh, I thought it was nine. Nine, anyway. Um, nine. But uh, our, our area of responsibility is North Carolina to Florida, over to the Louisiana Mississippi line, and uh, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And so, to, um, some ports that you might have heard of uh, in the area, Charleston Harbor, Savannah Harbor, Jacksonville. If you've gone on a Disney cruise, you might be uh, familiar with Canaveral. And um, if you want to go see your favorite Argentinian football player, um, you can go to the Port of Miami and hang out on South Beach. And we also have some big ports uh, in Mobile and Tampa Bay. Um, in general, a couple years ago, I think the budget for navigation for this area is probably on the order of about $400 million a year. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how we at the RSM Center help manage uh, the navigation program and promote RSM beneficial use, uh, talk about some of the Corps of Engineers policies and approaches uh, to beneficial use, and um, one thing we really focused on in the beginning was the business case. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how it makes economic sense and how we justify a lot of our, our projects. And uh, finally, we'll, we'll take the next step. And so the, the center was established in 2015. We did a bunch of studies at the beginning. We learned a lot, and then we started implementing those things that we learned. All right, so like I said, established in 2015, um, up until recently, the whole time, um, and the goal was to provide assistance and to make sure that RSM and beneficial use were strategies that were being implemented across the region. So we do technical guidance, um, and we also sit shoulder to shoulder with the engineers and the districts, go out in the field and do work. And so as of 20. 20 I made this figure and we had done about 40 projects so we do about seven or eight projects a year um, some of them very large that last multiple years some very small that are only a couple months um, we do big regional projects and then we do very specific things so um, one thing they'll talk about today is a regional assessment of rsm strategies um, and then we do stuff like wind wave analyses and king sediment uh, hydrodynamic studies in Southeast Florida and stuff like that. So it's a it's a wide range and we recruit expertise as we need it on different projects. And um, let's go, click. Okay, so policy is critical. Um, we can't do anything um, without the policy in place to, to execute our mission. So um, I'm gonna talk about a few of these. Um, when, we, when we started the center, there was a big push for engineers over the last 10 years, 20 years to really go towards beneficial use. And so if you're interested in looking at these policies, I don't, I don't know what the rules are in Argentina, but we have a lot of good ones. Um, I encourage you to look at them and I'll talk a lot about how we look at those policies and, and implement them. So um, my friend Matt Schrader wrote a great paper in 2019 that talked about all the policies 2019 and earlier. And one of the big ones that you'll always hear in the Corps of Engineers is what we call the federal standard. And so the federal standard means 
that when we look at a dredging project and disposal of material or placement of material, we have to do the least cost alternative that is engineeringly sound and meets the environmental standards. And so that was put in place so we don't, with so we're good stewards of the taxpayer dollar and we don't spend excessively on our dredging program. Um, a lot of people think that's a, a hindrance um, because it doesn't allow us to do certain projects but um, because it might be more expensive. But um, I think it's a good policy and it, it challenges, challenges us to think about what we're doing and really, really be good stewards of the taxpayer money. Um, a couple of other things that came out right when the core, um, when the center was started in 2016, um, Congress said, hey, we'd, we'd really like it if you'd stop dumping in open water. Um, they want us to keep the sediment in the system, don't dredge it out, and then put it offshore. They want us to keep it in the system, and um, we at the center look at anything that stays in the system as beneficial use, whether it's um, water injection like they're doing here and just pushing it on along, or if we're dredging and, and placing physically on a marsh. Um, another thing Congress did in, in 2016 was they had a beneficial use pilots pro program. And so they, they funded 10 projects. They said that the government would pay the difference, what we call the delta, between the federal standard cost and what it might cost to do this beneficial use project. And the idea would be to promote different um, beneficial use strategies and, and, and get people moving in that direction. And so we were very proud in the South Atlantic Division to get three of those 10 projects. So Burton said there's nine districts, nine divisions. No other district got more than one, and we got three. So we were very proud of that. Um, and this has been mentioned several times, the 70% beneficial use by 2030. All right. So the first thing we really did um, when we started out at the center was we took the economic approach, the business approach to to promoting RSM. We always heard that beneficial use was too expensive and it was too hard. Well, life's hard, so get over it. But but the economic question was something that was really, really tough for us to get through. So we, we did this 2016 RSM optimization study, and then we did what we call this true cost of dredging study. And so the optimization study looked at all of the South Atlantic Division and showed how can we optimize the budget to do more dredging for less. And then we did something that hadn't been done before, which was to quantify the value of RSM. And so you talk about ecosystem services and, and a lot of, everybody thought that these are great benefits, but they're very difficult to get to put a number on. And so we took a very simplistic approach and I'll show you about it in a minute, but we were able to quantify that value and it was, it was pretty eye popping and, and got us a lot of, um, help, helped us move, move things forward. Um, the other thing is by evaluating all of the projects throughout the South Atlantic Division, we're able to assess where we were doing well, where we can improve. And then by working with all those districts, we were allowed, we were showing the Mobile District, what they were doing in North Carolina, North Carolina, what they were doing in Florida. So we were learning from ourselves. Um, true cost of dredging, I'll skip that for now, but we'll talk about it in a few slides. Okay. So the optimization, um, we looked at every project, I don't remember how many there were, probably about 100 or so, um, focused on navigation, but we, had, we really focused on navigation and our, we have a flood risk management program, which is our beach program. And those are the two major players um, in, the, in South Atlantic Division related to navigation. So um, the, the strategy here is you have You have a, a, a dredging spot in this particular place, this is a, and this is beach quality sand. And so your options are in this area, you can either place it on the beach or you can place it in a DMMA, which I'm gonna say a lot here. So a DMMA is dredge material management area. It's an upland confined place with dikes where you put the sediment in. Uh, so you have those two choices. And when we look at it um, on a cycle, at this particular location, um, right here is my favorite fishing spot. I live right close to here. Um, we dredge every five years in about 500,000 cubic yards. And so one cubic meter is about 1.3 cubic yards for reference. Um, 
this particular case, the beach placement job is cheaper. So we look at it, 8.3 million to go to Adima May, 6.7 to go to, to the beach. And so in this particular case, the RSM option is cheaper, uh, it's more efficient, but we went a next step and quantified the value of that beach sand. From a navigation purpose uh, perspective and from a contract, you say, okay, I saved, I saved 1.6 million on that contract, great. But in reality, you put 500,000 cubic yards of sand on that beach that's worth, if they were to have to do it themselves, $10 a cubic yard. So you've provided $5 million of value at one stop. That's huge. This is a, this is a state park. Um, lots of turtle nesting, so there's a lot of environmental benefits there. And so overall, you're saving $1.3 million a year. And so that's the, that's the strategy there, just to quantify economically what that looks like. We, weren't, we didn't put any value on a turtle or turtle habitat. We just used the straight numbers um, if you were to have to do that project independently. All right, so what we learned um, is that we're saving or we're creating value, we use the term value, of almost $100 million a year. With the budget at $400 million a year, that's enormous, enormous value. Um, what's that? Okay, I think it was on the other one. And this concept, this got the 2016 Corps of Engineers Innovation of the Year. So they loved it. Um, we made a web app and all kind of stuff. But um, the concept was really, really positive. And so in the South Atlantic Division, I think Victor said we were at 30% overall, 35. We're at about 50%. Um, we're really good at putting beach sand on the beach. That's really easy. And like he said, some of the other stuff's a little bit more challenging. And so what we identified was that with our silty sands and our mud, um, we could do a little bit better. And so we came up with a few strategies. I'll show you how we implemented those in a minute. And you can see that all the districts, we have five districts, four of them were in the 40s and 50s, and one of them could, could use a little bit of improvement. We'll get back to that. Click. <laughs> um, and so now we're gonna talk about the true cost of dredging. This is another area where we made a lot of um, progress with, with the program managers to really look at the cost and the true cost. So generally, when we think about the federal standard, you have a contract, I'm gonna dredge 300,000 cubic yards next year, and these are my options. And the federal standard only includes the dredging cost or what's in that contract. And the reality is, that there's what we have incidental cost here. And so if we were to use a dredge material management area, big upland confined areas, somebody had to go out and pay for the property, you had to build the dikes, you had to get it permitted, you have to maintain it. And those are huge costs. You're talking about buying hundreds of acres and very valuable areas of the, of the country in the coastal zone. And so what we saw with a, a quick study in Jacksonville Harbor is that when you include these incidental costs, your true costs are much higher. In many cases, for beach nourishment um, especially, the incidental cost with, with beneficial use aren't that high. And so we basically, we, we evaluated and we said that in general, if you're, if you're using this method, the direct cost method, most likely, if you're within four, 15% or so um, of the federal standard, you, you should really consider that beneficial use option because the reality is that you probably have an incidental cost you're not including. And um, since we developed this paper, I'll show you in a little while, but in our dredge material management plans, um, we started including these incidental costs. Okay, so I said a little while ago that we had a district that um, need to improve on their beneficial use, and we were not doing enough with muds and silty sands and things like that. So we had Jekyll Creek, and so Jekyll Creek is our intercoastal waterway. This is a mostly recreation, um, but it's a 150-foot wide channel, 12 feet deep, so kind of shallow. 
Um, and we had the worst, what we're calling speed bump. I don't know if that translates um, in the South Atlantic division. So they had 500,000 cubic yards of material that needed to be, so they can get to depth. Down more, <laughs> down. Other way, other way. Up. The other way. <gasps> no, no. <laughs> like five ten or so. Sorry about this. Down. Down. Oh, I'm not doing anything on this one. Down. 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 <laughs> All right. So um, there were spots here that were at almost at zero. And so this was a very common scene. Um, the same type of material we see right out here. Um, mud. And so we had to get creative. Um, there was no upland site where we could put this mud, where, where oftentimes we, we do put the, the silty material. And so we had to do beneficial use. So next slide, please. Um, so we did two strategies. Uh, we did thin layer placement, which, is, um, which is a, has a lot of interest in the United States right now, uh, especially in the coastal zone. We have sea level rise, and this is a strategy to to add sediment to the marsh slowly over time to help it accrete and, and keep up with sea level rise. Um, it has benefits for maintaining the marshes, a lot of ecosystem benefits, and it also has flood risk management benefits. Um, the marshes are very good at buffering storms and things like that. And so we did a thin layer placement project and we also did open water dispersal. And so here between Jekyll Island and St. Simons Island is a deep scour hole. Um, we pumped that material, I want to say seven miles. It, it was a long way, long pump. Um, and, and it dispersed. And so we put it out there um, next to the, we put it within, I think we said the pipe had to be within eight feet of the bottom or something like that. Um, so it put it down, dispersed. It's a very turbid area, just like you have here. Um, we had no turbidity issues, and we did a sediment tracer study, and it, it did exactly what we thought it would do. It, it would disperse quite well. So we did those two um, we did those two strategies, and um, it was the first thin layer placement project in the South Atlantic Division, and um, it required a whole lot of coordination. Um, Eddie talked about this a lot. Stakeholder engagement and coordination was huge um, to put 5,000 cubic yards of mud on the uh, on the marsh surface required a lot of commitment from from a lot of people, and we knew we'd get a lot of uh, scrutiny, uh, some people for it and against it. But the reality was the Georgia Department of uh, Natural Resources, excuse me, was completely with us. They were completely on our side. They said they got calls all the time. What are you doing, letting the Corps of Engineers do this? And they explained to them why it was a good idea. And we never got any of the complaints. It always went to, to um, Georgia DNR, and, and they were great advocates for us, and, and it worked out great. We also had the Nature Conservancy, the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway Association, the Jekyll Island Authority. Everybody was, excuse me, on board. And like I said, that was within the Savannah District. They've since um, started doing more beneficial use in Brunswick Harbor and Savannah Harbor. So they really turned around their program. Um, from a beneficial use perspective. Um, this was featured in that engineering with nature atlas that Burton was talking about earlier. Oop. All right. And we won an award. Click. All right, so something that's really relevant to, to what you guys were talking about right in your own backyard is our dredge material management plans. And so in the Corps of Engineers, if you are running out of capacity, you have to make a plan to take care of your material for up to 20 years. Um, we're essentially committed to these ports for much, much longer. So there's been examples throughout the Southeast where we'll look a little bit longer. Um, we did one to 
2060 in Kings Bay. And uh, and here's an example of, of of generally what they look like. We go through all the different alternatives, which I have listed here, and then we come up with a solution. This is the amount of dredging that's required, and then we step through the different stages of, of how we maintain that capacity. Um, and in general, I think every project in the South Atlantic, it takes more than one option. So you can't just have a DMMA, you can't just do beneficial use, you can't just go offshore. It's gonna take a lot. So you can see that we had a bunch of different steps here where we're gonna phase things in over time. So. All right, so over here, here are the options that we had for Jacksonville Harbor. Again, these are just represent, um, don't wanna get bogged down on the numbers. But in general, the cost, Sixteen to eighteen dollars, twenty dollars for all the different options, um, base unit cost, whether that's beneficial use on the beach, near shore placement, or upland capacity. Click. All right. <laughs> um, and so when we did our um, our true cost, and looked at the incidental cost, and what you see is that our offshore placement, which in 2016 they told us, hey would you please stop doing that, um, is relatively cheap. All you have to do is get a lease from a federal agency. And and it's usually a very large capacity. And so once you divide that cost by a very large number, the cost per cubic yard is very low. Um, the BMMA option, you see the BMMA, BMMA, BMMA. Yeah. They're highly variable, but you can see that they're generally pretty high. Um, the newest one up here is $14. That includes buying that land, building the dike. And so you can see that that, that cost is pretty high. And then the RSM option in this particular case is kind of low. I will say that with thin layer placement, our incidental costs were very high for that. Um, it's very expensive to work on a marsh. Um, what else do I want to say? And then the true cost, you see quite a range. And we had to pick several of those. So we're going to do DMMA. We'll probably do beach and near shore placement. And I think we're going to be able to go away. I don't remember. I think we're going to be able to go away from offshore. But but ultimately, we have to do a couple options. Click. So what we've learned was these DMMAs are, are very important. Um, we're taking material out of the system, putting it up on land, but at the same time, that's the only election we really have for, for the silty material. And so they're very expensive and we, we value that capacity. So our goal is to maintain it um, because buying hundreds of acres now is gonna be very difficult. Um, whoa. Can we go back one? Down, 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 the other down. Up, up one more, please, one more. Am I missing one in there? Down, down, the other down. Down, I just, we'll just stop there. What was I saying? <laughs> Um, oh yeah, well the, well the capacity is very valuable and so um, we do a lot of active management and one thing that we really started looking in was promoting beneficial use of the material in the DMMAs. And so we did a, a big study um, across the South Atlantic Division, made a big database of all of our DMMAs, the basic characteristics, how big they were, how tall the dikes were, what type of material was in it, what type of access did you have? Can you only get there by boat? Can you get there by car, truck? And uh, and what what opportunities do you have? You know, can you do thin layer placement? You send it to roads. What what can you do? Um, and so that was it was a big effort, and it really got everybody in the division to start thinking about the value of those DMMAs and what they could do to to offload them and get the material out so that we can use we can maintain that capacity for, for much longer. 
um, a couple of success stories. Uh, Manatee Harbor, this is in a little harbor inside of Tampa Bay. We, I want to say we, I don't know the number. It was about 100,000 cubic yards, maybe 200, where the sponsor trucked the material to a couple of miles away uh, to fill in an area and made it a county park. So that was a very positive thing. Um, in Jacksonville Harbor, we have we divide the cells within the DMMA for different types of material. So we have it subdivided for a sandy area, and then the Department of Transportation comes in, takes that material, and builds roads with it. And then uh, some smaller projects in South Florida, they've used the DMMAs for housing developments and things like that for sediment. Um, looking around, when we went around the division, thinking about this, the big thing we saw was that there's still a lot of beach quality sand in these DMMAs, but a lot of times they're only accessible by water, so that's a challenge. But, but we see a lot more opportunities with beach sand and maybe even back bay areas that are sandy. Next. All right, so that's all I have. Any questions? I see. Okay. Sorry, Mom, I haven't talked for 20 minutes straight in a long time. <laughs> Good question. Oh, no, go ahead. Me voy a hacer en español, eh? How do I need to get my headphones? <laughs> eh, quería saber. Hola, hola. ¿Escuchas? Ok. Quería saber si cuando aplican esa técnica de capa fina, eh, hacen previamente estudios de impacto o de evaluación ambiental, porque puede que eso resulte en impactos positivos como también negativos. Y si en esa evaluación interviene alguna autoridad de aplicación, ya sea la, la EPA o la NOA. question in English was when you look at thin layer placement what kind of permits um, do you have to get and assessments and things like that so for the this pilot study um, in theory it would have been a lot more complex so when you um, when you do a DMMP you're supposed to get all your placement areas permitted um, and this per and and that does include the assessments impacts, um, positive and negative. In this particular case for Jekyll, and I think this is going to be the model throughout the entire Southeast, is that the Corps of Engineers is just going to have to work directly with the state resource agencies and the federal resource agencies and determine what the assessment needs to look like. What do you need to study um, from sediment, physical characteristics, elevations, um, plants, um, biota and things like that. But what we did is we worked directly with Georgia DNR and we went out and we did, we did surveys of elevation. Um, so we knew exactly what elevation it was, what habitat was in there, and what habitat we expect at those different elevations. And so we decided that we could lift it I'll do 25 centimeters at the most. Um, without going up into the next habitat zone, which was a goal, w was the goal to stay in the one we were at. And so we could go up about that high. We decided that we were going to use coconut core log to contain it. Their big concern was if you pump this material in, is it going to go into those small little creeks and tributaries where so many of the small fish and, and things like that live and we didn't want to drown them. And so um, they according to the rules in the United States, turbidity doesn't matter until it gets into the receiving waters, which in this particular case was the main channel. So a big creek. So there's, in theory, those little tributaries don't count for turbidity, but we all felt that, that was important and we agreed with them. Um, the coconut core logs were pretty effective at holding the sediment in. Um, it did leak a good bit. Uh, but but it did not make it never made it out to the main creek. There were a few little ones in the back, um, 
and so we adjusted how we did the dredging. So Georgia DNR was out there with us every day, and we'd sit there. We're going to dredge at 1 o'clock, and we go do our thing. Um, and then we, we wrote a scope of work um, together to define what, what, it should, what we should study. So we, we, um, we wrote that together. The Corps of Engineers paid for it through what we call a CESU program, which is the Continuing education, no, community eco, yeah, an academic partnership. Um, and so we got a, a team from Georgia Southern University and University of South Carolina to do all the biological stuff. And, um, and that was about it. And so the study lasted for two years after the project and the, the project had not recovered all the way. So we added another two years to it. And so the thought is, after this project, and we'll coordinate with other people throughout the United States to determine how we assess impact. So it's, it's a first timer, um, and, and that's the way it'll go. Um, South Carolina is doing the exact same thing, and North Carolina is as well. North Carolina is trying to, they're, they're both trying to figure out what it looks like and how to regulate it. And it's going to be the very first, the first few projects are going to be very expensive and very small with the hope that down the road we'll get more efficient at this and um, you know, it won't cost as much. That was a very long answer, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, more a comment rather than a question. Okay. So. Uh, I want to build on uh, some of the great uh, presentations that, that Eddie and Clay uh, have been giving us this, this morning. Realize a lot of this information is on the Engineering with Nature website. And so uh, just come see me sometime today and I'll be glad to, to give you that web link. A lot of great information is there. Um, one word that I heard that could be very relevant here in Argentina is that, that concept of pilot, uh, the idea of uh, a, a small scale project as a demonstration for, for, for well, whether it work, would work here, how well would it work here, uh, what lessons can it, it provide us to uh, consider or inform full scale projects here in Argentina. So great for, for pilots and great for pilots that Clay just talked about at Jekyll Island, small scale, we learned so much for that. And so we can build on those lessons learned and upscale those. And the last thing I wanna mention basically is we're not placing dredge material at centimeter depth at very high quality habitat. A lot of times these habitats are degraded, they're being inundated by sea level rise. And so the idea is to uplift that habitat in addition to increasing, providing the flood risk management benefits that we seek uh, from that uh, habitat as well. So again, it's thinking about people Benefits for people and the environment. You know, we're not we're not putting dredge material in high quality habitat. A lot of times we are improving the habitat by placing the bed, dredge material on it with great intent of providing habitat value as well. Thank you. If you Google Erdic E R D C thin layer placement, you'll you'll get a web page with all kind of projects. Um, I think it, we still have time. I think we're well. Uh, so thank you. That was a very nice presentation. The you had to, perhaps your last one of your last tables, you showed the cost of offshore placement being substantially lower than the other alternatives, and especially when you looked at the dredging costs, the incidental costs, and then the total costs, and the total cost was lowest. But it was interesting because you also talked about another way of looking at it is to add the benefits or cost offsets. So had you thought of taking that table, one more column that shows the cost offsets where perhaps offshore placement would have zero benefit, but many of the other ones would have a much greater benefit and you would show more value for the other alternatives in comparison. Yeah, we could, and if you could put some dollar amounts on that slide that you had, that would be very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but, um. Yeah, the whenever we were doing that assessment, one thing I, I noticed was the farther away we have the ocean disposal site, the better all the other options look. Uh, yeah. Because it's the, the transport costs. Yeah. But if it's really close to the channel, they're, they're, it's 
from an economic perspective, they're very efficient. Um, environmentally, not at all. All right, thank you. Thank you, Craig. And uh, for the last uh, speaker of this session, we're going to call uh, Tiago Becerra Correa. Tiago is a civil engineer with an environmental background. Uh, he has a master's degree in hydrodynamics, and he currently he works for Rambol in Sao Paulo, and uh, he's a YPL server to Ebicom. So, please. least we are the same height, so yeah. it won't be yeah. necessary to. Yeah. Well, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah. So I'm going to move a little bit the uh, subject, subject here and talk about offshore wind. Uh, uh, as before uh, I start here, uh, in Brazil, I believe that we have a similar uh, similar context as in Argentina. Uh, we have so much potential, natural potential for uh, energy. The other countries talk about energy transition, but I believe that in our case, we are more to energy. There's a diversif diversification uh, as we already have a, a clean matrix, but uh, we also we yet have some gaps in our industry. So this study is about um, knowing it, which gaps we have in, in the industry that we have to overcome to make feasible all this uh, energy diversif diversification. Um, in this case study, we have uh, looked at on one state of Brazil, Ceará, the north the northeast of Brazil. I'm gonna show you the map very soon. So the agenda is uh, an introduction. I'm going to tell you about how we um, pick the, the best uh, sites to develop these projects. Uh, then I'm going to talk about, uh, about the, the, the wind farms, potential wind farms in the state of Ceará, uh, and move on to su supply uh, chain gap analysis that we did to understand what we should do to overcome these uh, constraints. Uh, uh, part of the of the infrastructure that has, that has to be updated, upgraded is the port infrastructure. As I see here in Bahia Blanca, you have um, lots of spaces to develop. And uh, normally uh, for uh, offshore wind farms, for installation of, of wind farms, uh, we need um, big yards to assemble the parts, you know. So I'm going to talk about it uh, very soon. And then uh, we're going to have a space for uh, to talk. <laughs> so, uh, this study paving the way for Ceará's uh, offshore wind industry was funded by the Danish uh, Energy Agency. Rambo is a Danish-based uh, company. Uh, and it was a program named InnoWind uh, Brazil and Denmark, a cooperation. Uh, our primary scopes for this work was uh, first, the gap analysis of Brazil offshore wind supply chain. Uh, there are lots of industries uh, within this kind of, of project. And uh, we did a high level analysis of port, port infrastructure uh, to the installation of these wind farms and also for operation and management as well. Uh, this report is available in the internet. So uh, I believe that this presentation will be available for you. So you can just click click here and read all the report. It's free and uh, yeah, it's in English. So I, I believe that uh, it's more accessible. Well, first of all, uh, just for you to um, locate yourselves in, in the map. Uh, this is the coast of Brazil, Atlantic coast. Uh, and these areas, they are the potential um, 
areas for developing wind farms. Um, here is Rio Grande do Sul State in the south, which is uh, in, in the border with Uruguay. Uh, Rio de Janeiro in the number four square there. Uh, and up in the northeast, we have uh, three states with the, in fact, four states with uh, more potential wind farms. Uh, from west to the east, uh, we have um, Maranhão State, Piauí, Ceará, which is our uh, object of study, and Rio Grande do Norte. These uh, two areas, which are, is bigger here in, in the slides, uh, the area number two and number three, they are um, the areas with more potential of wind speed and, uh, how can I say, and windy, um, it, it more constant winds, you know? Yeah, consistent, <laughs> thanks. So uh, that's why we chose uh, Ceará, because uh, prior to this uh, work here, um, well, uh, w so our main challenge here were uh, the environmental infrastructure uh, constraints. How can we overcome this? Understanding the supply uh, chain gaps and which are the needs for the port infra infrastructure uh, upgrades. Before this work, we have um, given a consultancy for Copenhagen offshore uh, wind, uh, which they uh, asked us to choose the best places to develop these offshore wind farms. So I'm going to talk about this only in one or two slides, and then I'll, I'll come back to the study. Uh, the thing is, that we can deal with the three first topics, but there's something that is, is still going on. Uh, our Congress is uh, voting um, a new uh, regulatory framework. Uh, so before this uh, thing comes comes by, we uh, don't expect to start the projects. But the investors, they are um, they want to be prepared when uh, this regulation comes comes out. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this first work we did for Copenhagen offshore, uh, which was choosing the best places to 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 uh, to develop. Uh, so we we make this uh, site assessment, which is a um, uh, uh, geospatial analysis. With uh, we we pick some specific uh, um, specific uh, topics and choose some experts to evaluate which constraints each area has. And then we, with this gap analysis, we make some environmental analysis, infrastructure analysis, make a multi-criteria um, multi uh, evaluation to say to them which areas are the best. So uh, first of all, we start with a high level analysis, then um, deeper, um, and this is the first first part of the tunnel. Then in the, um, in the, the next step, uh, uh, the ones which has gone through the tunnel have more specific analysis. And in the end, we make the site ranking for the ones that were more suitable. So site ranking, they are the feasible areas and the investor uh, can choose any, any of these depending on how much they they want to invest. Well, so let's talk about uh, Ceará. Uh, here, uh, just for you to have um, uh, an idea, we have 22 potential offshore wind farms that were proposed by investors uh, in, in Ceará State and other 14 in the uh, states. So, uh, of, uh, of course, not, not all of them will uh, be built. Uh, we believe that it, it isn't even possible because some of them overlaps. Um, but our challenge is to help them to pick the best ones. Well, uh, just for to mention it, the average speed in in the region is 8.5 meters per second, 
and the average uh, deep, uh, water depth in, in for these uh, offshore wind farms are 22 meters deep. So uh, it requires only um, monopiles foundation, which is much cheaper than the um, deeper areas, which requires more expensive foundations. So let's go to the supply chain gap analysis. Oh, first of all, uh, we started looking for the whole life cycle of an offshore wind project from the planning until the commissioning. And we have seen that there are six phases that are uh, to be considered. And these phases, they were uh, separated in 17 uh, supply chain gap analysis. So uh, we started with the uh, project uh, development and engineering, uh, the finance as well, the manufacturing and supply, construction and installation, uh, then commissioning, testing, operation and maintenance, and the commissioning. Uh, of course, we have uh, six, uh, six to seven if we uh, consider the contract and finance. Uh, we have six, seven phases, but this study, the majority of the um, the categories were uh, considered in manufacturing and supply, construction and, and installation and operation and maintenance. Um, well, considering these uh, phases, we have picked three types, three criteria. criteria. Um, which are offshore wind track record, uh, how much experience our industry has to serve this, this market, um, the capability in rela related sectors, for, for example, oil and gas. Uh, we, we have a um, uh, well-developed oil and gas industry which can be adapted for offshore wind farms. Uh, natural uh, localization potential, for example, uh, how how well our uh, place is uh, prepared to receive this kind of of projects? So uh, we have four uh, levels here for each criteria. Uh, as I said, we have several uh, categories, so I'm, I won't present all of all of them. So just a highlight of our main opportunities and in the next slide, the main gaps that we have to overcome. So uh, let's start with the wind farm uh, supply of towers. Uh, we already have a track record for uh, onshore wind power, uh, which is beginning to be developed in, in Brazil. We, we already have some sites, um, but it has to be uh, kind of adapted because the size of the towers for offshore wind industry is different, so it's bigger. So uh, we we can take advantage of this, but of course uh, it's different. Uh, also, we have um, uh, we are uh, a way ahead for serv service providers on in project management. Uh, we have um, good uh, good consultancies, engineering uh, engineering. Uh, firms that can that are established in Brazil and can serve offshore wind, wind industry uh, and multinational service providers which has offices in Brazil. So uh, with partnership with other countries and developing our research and development, we can also uh, take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, and last but not least, uh, our service vessels, uh, despite we don't have uh, vessels um, that, that were built for uh, offshore industry, uh, there, are, there are other industries which there, these vessels could be adapted for offshore uh, wind farms. So, for example, oil and gas, and we also have shipyards in Brazil that with uh, minor retrofit retrofitting could be uh, an option for offshore wind farms. 
Uh, of course, um, this study was about the gaps. Uh, how can we overcome it, this? Uh, so uh, the first main gap is uh, the supply uh, of cells and hubs. These are parts of the um, of the wind turbines generators. Uh, we don't have this uh, industry in, in Brazil for offshore wind farms, but we have for others um, related sectors. Uh, and these really, um, sectors, they are already on their capabilities. So we expect that we will have a, a more developed uh, industry after we have a pipeline of at least 10 megawatts, me uh, gigawatts, sorry, uh, of projects. Um, other industry that has to be more developed is uh, the foundations for monopiles. Uh, as I said, this is this is the more simple uh, foundations for offshore winds uh, towers, but uh, we already have we don't have yet uh, this industry developed. So uh, that's something that we have to to do. And in the end, the wind turbine generators. Um, it's um, well for installation for installing these wind wind turbine generators. Um, we have, how can I say, we have uh, some vessels that are very specific. So even in, in the world, these um, specialized jack-up vessels, they are in high demand. So we expect that um, maybe uh, we can, when these projects are out of the paper, maybe we'll have these vessels available. Well, uh, it's impossible to develop a wind farm without uh, port infrastructure. So uh, we started looking uh, at the ports that w already exists in in the northeast of Brazil, and which of them were more suitable, and which upgrades would be required. Okay. Uh, so first of all we uh, decided a benchmark to see uh, what's the acceptable and the recommended uh, characteristics of a, of a port to receive this kind of uh, project. And then based on that, uh, we saw that the two ports in the state of Ceará were, uh, were how can I say, they, they were the acceptable, not the recommended. Uh, there would be some uh, minor upgrades um, but they were the most suitable when compared to the neighboring states. So I'm going to show you here in the map. Uh, you can see that they are well positioned. They're, they are the, uh, the two green uh, squares there, uh, Port of Pesen and Port of Fortaleza. Port of Pesen has uh, an advantage in relation to Port of Fortaleza because they have a vast area of uh, of uh, they have a retro retro area with some industries, even industry industry for onshore wind, and uh, the port authority they are willing to invest in in the offshore wind farms as as well. So this is a good potential for our state. So uh, in this study, we also made a simple case study, uh, how could be the um, these improvements well, to receive the, the uh, offshore wind farms. And we saw that there are plenty of options. Uh, we developed two alternatives, one in the uh, one here in the uh, to extend the pier, the alternative two. The other uh, with a new row row berth that already exists, but it, it could be extended. Uh, but this option would require to uh, expand the connection with the land. So uh, these were the installation parts. They must be bigger. They uh, have to, um, to, to be prepared to receive bigger vessels and everything. Uh, but also, we need to operation, op op operation parts for uh, maintenance and and also for uh, services. 
And these parts, they don't have to be so big. Uh, we already have other minor parts uh, that aren't so demanded, which could be used for uh, wind, char, uh, wind farms operation and, and, and management. So just to have a picture here, um, we would have uh, within a 30 nautical miles uh, for daily operations, uh, these these vas uh, these uh, parts, it's one, two, three, uh, it's seven parts, candidates, parts. And for major repairs, uh, they, uh, they have to be a little bigger, but they can be also a little farther from the farms. We have uh, almost the same options. So uh, in the end, we see that um, we have good, um, a good potential. Of course, uh, our parts are more well pre prepared to receive this, uh, uh, this goods than our industry. But um, we, we, we see that, uh, that, that market as, um, with a good potential. So uh, we have other partners for this study, for example, uh, Part of Pesen, FIEC, the Copenhagen offshore partners, and uh, and thank you very much for listening for this case study. Okay. <laughs> um, is this on? Yeah. Uh, in Brazil, they have a huge hydropower industry that's mm -hmm. environmentally sustainable. Um, what is the need uh, or the demand for offshore wind mm -hmm. relative to the other sources of power they have in the, in, in Brazil? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, indeed, our main source of power is uh, the hydropower, but in the recent years, we have faced many droughts and it's not so constant. Um, and so uh, one of the, the um, strategies of, of the government is diversifying, as we were saying. That's why I said in, in the beginning of the, um, of the presentation, that our main uh, challenge isn't the transition, but there's a diversifying. And this diversification was going against the, the transition because many of the investments were on the fuel, uh, fossil fuel, you know, like thermal, um, uh, thermal power plants. Uh, so the offshore and onshore wind farms, they can um be a um how can i say a backup for for the the hydropower uh, generation also solar energy and other renewable sources uh, i got one question okay. <laughs> you want to here um also related because uh, why do you go to offshore to like uh, we got the same uh, capacity of uh, like Brazil we have a lot of space here you can see we have a lot of wind farms around our area which is mm -hmm. pretty pretty good why did you have to recur to going offshore with mm -hmm. all the additional costs mm -hmm. that implies to actually operate and and put in place the, the turbines? Yeah, yeah. another good question. <laughs> uh, normally, we see that uh, the priority, is when comparing onshore and offshore wind farms, uh, the priority are the onshore uh, projects. Uh, it's cheaper, as you said, uh, we have less, um, how can I say, it requires less investments, uh, but we also have another trend, which is the uh, green hydrogen. And uh, for green, green hydrogen, the offshore wind is uh, more, uh, 
more suitable because it's closer to to the parts. Uh, it's easier to 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 make these uh, electrolysis to to uh, to generate the hydrogen. So uh, we see this um, this source of power uh, not only as um, a source of energy for Brazil, but also for exporting. Yep. Thank you. No, voy a hacer en castellano. Oh, no eh, problema. ¿Cuál es la diferencia que ustedes eh, monitorearon entre la velocidad de viento promedio offshore y la velocidad de viento promedio onshore, como para tomar una decisión? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good question, but uh, I don't know uh, exactly the answer. Um, I'm, Uh, as a consultant, I wasn't um, into projects of onshore wind, so I don't have this data. But uh, I'll, I'll look for it. I'll ask my colleagues and see. And maybe later I can, if I if I can, can I answer you by email after? Yeah. So thanks and sorry for not having the answer. <laughs> Gotcha. Okay, um, that would be it for the second uh, session. We had planned a further discussion of uh, Q&A, but if no one uh, is in for it, perhaps what we can do is shift uh, meal, have it now and gain half an hour. I don't know if everybody is okay with it. Yeah, um, um, yeah, the people. Uh, yes, <laughs> that would be the problem. Uh, perhaps uh, I don't know if uh, there are many people online now. We can uh, address them and uh, try to get them back. Just saying, just uh, if not, uh, we'll adjourn here and uh, come back uh, at uh, the well. 14 hours for us that would be 17 hours for uh, GMT so thank you very much and uh, please enjoy now lunch
Bueno, para vos, vos sos el protocolo, que nunca... Ya, ya, pará, entonces acá... Pero acá no, no vas a probar la... Sí, pero ¿cómo acá? Ahí, venimos más acá. Pero... Ahí, ahí. Bueno, ahí pero no te está, no está tapando el, no, el micrófono. A ver. Sí. Ministerio Ambiente y eh, un gran bueno. área grande sobra que después la chica. A ver, ahora explica. Dale. No, está en Facebook. Claro.
Hola, 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 hola. Sí.
Brian? You sent me yesterday your uh, you sent me yesterday your mini bio. Or probably last night. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's not even in my bio.
Tengo, tengo esta. Agarré esta. No, agarré esta que está mirando para allá. Start right now. Okay. Well, welcome back. Uh, we start the evening session. Um, now we're going to turn to the sessions related to PTGCC. Uh, the first one is going to be planning and delivering climate change resilient ports and coastal infrastructure. Uh, so, on yes. Uh, could you do that? Yeah. Okay, we're going to do a slight swap <laughs> and uh, have Jan, who is the chair of PTGCC, to do the presentation before uh, going into the session itself. Thank yeah, you. Is the presentation loaded up? Uh, So good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name's Jan Brook. I'm hoping there's going to be a short presentation loaded up to introduce PTGCC. Maybe not. <laughs> so <laughs> in, in which case, maybe I'll do it without the presentation. Yeah, so um, so within PIANC, Burton explained earlier how we have um, different commissions. Um, one of the permanent task groups under the Environmental Commission is the permanent task group on climate change. So that's PTGCC. So I chair that group. And that group has been set up to provide cross commission support on climate change issues. So that's climate change adaptation, climate change mitigation. And we do that through producing technical guidance, some of which we'll talk about today, but also by participating in international forums, for example, under the UN, and also through um, 
setting up events. So again, Burton mentioned earlier about the blue carbon in terms of reference. We had webinars on, on blue carbon, on the blue carbon markets. We also had webinars recently on um, the implications of invasive non-native species and how those are likely to uh, become more, more pronounced under the changing climate. So essentially what, what we're doing this afternoon is we're taking some of the climate change issues that PTGCC have been working on um, and also some that we're now starting to work on because our second session today will look at energy transition imports, which has very quickly become a very big topic. So um, the first session will look mainly at um, climate change adaptation and how you deliver uh, adaptation, resilience, um, how you take climate change into account in your port planning. And then the session afterwards, after the break, we'll look at energy transition. So, um, and I'm very happy to circulate some slides um, later on if uh, people would like to look at them, that's not a problem. But now I'll hand over to Brian, who's gonna talk about uh, prob probabilistic approaches for including climate change in planning and design. So Brian, over to you. Stand. Yeah, you can have to adjust this. But not as tall as ready. Hmm. Now, now I get to try to use the clicker, and there we go. I feel like that's good. All right, make me stand up straight. Very good. So yeah, thank you, uh, I'm Brian Joyner. I um, I have I'm a coastal engineer by trade, by practice. Uh, right now, I'm leading a lot of uh, coastal flood resiliency study and design projects, and I want to talk a little bit about some ways that um, we've looked at, we haven't really talked much about sea level rise today specifically as a process, but um, how sea level change, mostly sea level rise and other climate change factors like increased rainfall and things will and should affect our current design because it will affect our future environment and the things we're, we're working with in the nature and in the ports and in the other infrastructure. Uh, I will say, I should apologize right off the bat, I realize I don't have a picture of a single plant or <laughs> much nature in my presentation, so it won't be visually pretty as the ones you've seen already, but hopefully interesting. And I'm looking for the right button to press. Okay. I don't know what they're telling me, sorry. Oh, point in that direction. Ah, good, thank you. So, um, uh, today I'll talk mostly about, uh, like I said, how to allow for sea level rise in design. Um, we've Most of the example will be around a probabilistic or a statistical approach to how to include sea level rise, and that's mainly around the fact of the uncertainty of projected sea level rise. It's not one number or even one set of numbers. It's multiple with some uncertainty around it. And we'll do a case study of a, a port terminal in Baltimore, Maryland in the USA. And then we're gonna try to uh, apply that approach or at least talk about that approach relative to other things like breakwaters, um, maybe flood barrier or system operations. And I think these can also be applied to nature-based design as well because we're still looking at uh, water surface elevations that affect the success of the project, even, even when it's planting uh, and things like that. So with that, so when we design facilities for extreme conditions, like an extreme water level that may come with a large coastal weather event, um, such as a hurricane where I live, we, we are subject to pretty intense tropical storms and hurricanes. Um, I know here, we are talking with um, the folks here, you know, you don't get so much the cyclonic storms, but strong winds pushing up the bay and then backing the tidal cycle up in the estuary. And I'm sure different things happen in different parts of your, your, your localities. Um, we get extreme water levels that can cause operational downtime by flooding the port surface or by flooding streets and roads or um, overwhelming other systems. Uh, and they can cause damage that takes time to repair. So we want to design to consider those extremes. Likewise, extreme low water levels can also impact your operations with, with channels being non-navigable and other situations. So these extremes obviously are things that don't happen all the time and we have to find a way to project them because we probably haven't measured them. And when we design, sort of traditionally, without considering the probabilistic nature of things, um, historically engineers uh, have designed for discrete events. We might choose one return period, say a 50-year return period or a 2% annual exceedance probability, or maybe a 1% annual, annual exceedance probability. And maybe we choose a few of those and we try to design the system around those uh, criteria. But uh, what we sort of lack when we do that is usually anything about confidence limits, like how certain are we that that's the right number? 
And what happens if it isn't the right number? What's the sensitivity if that's not the right number? There's not really a great framework in that approach for considering uncertainty now and then future uncertainty with climate change. So if we take an approach using probability, uh, and we'll show what that looks like in a moment, we can think of the flood not as a one discrete number, but as a probability distribution or a set of numbers that we can you know, to use programming to, to calculate through. We contribute all, consider the different sources of variability and uncertainty, and that lets us talk, think about what the range of things might be and how it changes over time. Mm. So if we think about sea level rise, um, we've, we've all seen, or hopefully we've seen, reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, that um, over decades really has researched what uh, climate change might look like in terms of results of uh, increased global sea level, increased local sea levels, no, no, increased global sea levels, local is left to other agencies, uh, changing rainfall, increased rainfall in some places, decreased in others, more extreme events, more intense extreme events. And if we take sea level rise as, a, as one of those factors and we look at the emissions, the carbon emission scenarios coming out of the IPCC reports, we, we see that there's, there's multiple factors even in, in that sea level rise. There's ocean expansion, ice melt, um, and change in land water storage, other things like that, that, that all tie together in terms of what the mean sea level might be like in a given location into the future, decades into the future. And because the process isn't linear, it's not one continuous rate of change, then the uncertainty in the process changes over time. We might have more certainty about the number, about the sea levels we should design to in year 2030, but way less certainty about what those values should be for 2080 or 2100. So since we design infrastructure, and hopefully we design these nature-based features for very long uh, lifespans, um, I guess, uh, realizing for a minute, when we design infrastructure, we know it has a useful lifespan. We know the port needs a floating storage and recovery facility, and we project out capital usage of that for however many decades. But chances are we're going to need something different after that. Like our needs will change over time for infrastructure. But I think when we design natural systems, we, we very much want that nat natural system to persist. We want wetlands. We want uh, reefs and oysters and habitat. Uh, to persist for a very long time, and we don't really want those to go away. So both of these kinds of structures, infrastructure and nature-based uh, facilities, um, we really do want to think about how they can persist over a very long time. And so when we look at uncertainty and future sea level rise, I showed this map, and I know you can't see the numbers, even on this giant screen, uh, but this is an example from Baltimore, Maryland, which is positioned very far up north in the Chesapeake Bay, so again, it's, it's Lake Bahia Blanca. It's, it's very far from the open Atlantic Ocean. Um, it's in a really narrow estuary, uh, but it can still experience some extreme storms. The plot on the right, the chart on the right, indicates uh, future sea level rise projections. Each curve is a different projection of rising mean, daily mean tide levels in Baltimore. So there's, what, five of those curves, five different possibilities that are represented by the curves over the course of almost a century. And the reason for the plot is to illustrate that uh, one agency, our National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, has projected these five different possibilities based on the IPCC reports. Um, and we have multiple agencies predicting these, and all of these lines have a band of uncertainty around them. So the actual number to use is not very clear. We have a set of numbers. And we want to be able to think about all of those, not just choose one. We don't know exactly what curve we're on. So which, choose, which curve should I choose to design? There's not a ton of certainty around that. So we want to try to find a way to use all of that data. And that's part of this probabilistic approach. Um, belaboring the point a little bit. Uh, on the left is the sort of the probability of a certain sea level happening. You see in the near term, it's that band is narrow, meaning we have a little more certainty. And that band gets wider over time, meaning we have less certainty. And some researchers, including uh, Kopp et al. and others, have created, from the IPCC reports and other data surrounding that in their own research, have created curves that um, try to estimate what the, mm, what the probability of non-exceedance is. So what's the probability in, any, in the year 2050 of not exceeding two meters of sea level rise or one meter sea level rise? They've tried to create these probability curves that, um, that sort of tell us what that uncertainty looks like over the future. And 
you know, the numbers change by location. This is for uh, a place in Massachusetts that um, is, a, is a famous research organization in Woods Hole. Uh, you can see there's a lot of numbers and a lot of curves to use, and we want to try to find a way to use all of those and not just pick and choose from them. Uh, this is just another uh, indication of there are multiple researchers coming up with different probability curves. So Kopp et al. is on the top, and um, DeCanto and Pollard is on the bottom. They're similar, but, but different. And uh, the rest of our work, the work that we use, so Moffitt and Nickel, and for our work for the Maryland Port Authority and the Dundalk Marine Terminal, we, we chose to use the Kopp et al. numbers. And you'll see how we, we use those, hopefully usefully. So in a case study around uh, using this approach at the Dundalk Marine Terminal, I'll give you a little bit of background on what that terminal is. It's the Maryland Port Authority's terminal in the city of Baltimore. Uh, it's exposed to storm surge, uh, hurricane storm surge and winter storms and waves, not large ocean waves, but waves generated over the bay. And it's also e exposed to extreme rainfall that obviously provides runoff from the surface. And sometimes those things happen at the same time. You get large storm, large waves, and large rainfall at the same time. But the port itself uh, has 13 berths. You can see the statistics here. One of the important things about the port is that it's um, primarily, uh, I actually forgot to add it here, it's primarily automobile cargo and roll-on, roll-off, heavy roll-on, roll-off, heavy equipment, forest products, brake bulk and containers. So kind of a, a diverse range of cargo, but mostly automobiles and roll-on, roll-off. So uh, products that when, uh, like cars, especially autos, when you get a flood depth of nine inches or so, or, you know, less, less than a third of a meter, um, that cargo was lost. It's just damaged beyond selling. So the, the flood events at a terminal like this would, could damage cargo pretty significantly without a lot of flood depth. And so we wanted to look at, um, over, over time, what would be the risk to cargo and compare that to the cost of building flood mitigation structures. Uh, you can see the other statistics here. It's fairly large with 178 hectares of open storage space um, and then 10 sheds, four container cranes. So. Right, so if we look at trying to protect the cargo from an extreme storm event, and, and I will say in, in history, so over time, in the, in, the, sorry, in the historical past, they had not experienced a very large storm in decades. But then in the early 2000s, they experienced um, Hurricane Isabel. And that hurricane had water levels much higher than anything that had been recorded in recent history. So that really sort of changed the, the thought around what the design extreme water level would be. Um, that also resulted, I think, uh, if, I, if you do all the studies right, um, we have three different projections of what the extreme water level should be at the terminal. We've got the Federal Emergency Management Agency study, which is the blue line on the plot. We've got NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, which is the red line. And then the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, which is the green line. And the Corps of Engineers study is, I think, the more recent one. And it looked at uh, a very large set of model simulations of hurricanes and storms in the Chesapeake Bay that projected out uh, to a to very um, wide range of probabilities. So we've got a lot of good data coming out of that Corps of Engineers study. And you can see, uh, I don't know if you can see the numbers. And apologies, everything is in feet. I didn't convert this to meters, uh, all the graphics. That would have taken quite a lot of time. But you can see there's about uh, two feet or two thirds of a meter of difference between the Army Corps of Engineers projection of a certain storm level and the FEMA projection. Um, and that's, two feet is a lot when we're designing for this cargo terminal. Uh, so um, we wanted to basically try to get a sense around what would be the difference if we looked at one kind of extreme versus another and then added sea level rise to that. Uh, we did eventually go forward using the Army Corps of Engineers um, extreme values just to simplify the process and be a little more conservative. So when we're looking at long-term sea level rise, like I said, we need, we need to consider it because um, the facility itself, the terminal itself, is undergoing a design for a, kind of a, a large-scale berth redesign that will take a lot of time. But we need some interim flood measures to get to that point. So the point of this project that we did for the port was to look at the interim flood measures, how to design those most cost-effectively to get a really good uh, sort of benefit-to-cost ratio um, knowing that the design life was not very, very long. It might be on the order of a couple of decades. So how do we make that decision while looking at the extreme data without over-designing, without under-designing? Um, and then how do we do a solid analysis that we could use to, to ask for grant funding from agencies uh, with a good benefit-cost ratio? So 
um, again, we consider these curves that provide the um, uncertainty around sea level rise, and did some Monte Carlo simulations. It's a sort of a, a many thousands of simulations using variable input within the ranges of um, the what the curves tell us or the possibilities or the probabilities. And the results um, come out like this in that we see on the x-axis a given flood level or a flood elevation. I should say the elevation at the top at the peak of the terminal, the terminal um, edge elevation is around 7.5 feet on this chart. Uh, and the flood elevations are up to the 8, 9, 10, 10 and a half, 11 feet sometimes. Um, so between half a foot and, and three to four feet of flooding that we're dealing with possibly. But what this tells us is for a given flood level, what's the likelihood over a given time? Each curve is a time frame. So the really bright pink curve is over 80 years. We would expect that uh, the elevation 10 feet might have a uh, 10 percent likelihood of occurrence, while an elevation of eight feet has a 70 percent likelihood of occurrence. So this helps us to plan on our time frames. If we have a 20-year time frame, we can choose the curve for that. If we have a 40-year time frame, we can choose the curve for that. Oops, I'm clicking through too fast. So that's what the flood levels looked like. Again, this is all documented in some reports that you you could see. Um, and it's it's done in a in a large map code, so we get a very large matrix of output that we then try to compare with what would be the costs to the port and to its stakeholders and to the owners of the cargo if nothing was done. What's the cost of no action and certain storms occur? So the um, panel on the left shows areas of the terminal that would be flooded under a given uh, storm elevation. You can see there's elevations that would cover the entire terminal while some of the lower elevations have very limited reach. Uh, but then on the cost curve on the right, we can see, um, I should say these numbers are things I meant to check and um, I changed these, but for the one we hand over, I'll, I'll fix the numbers. But what you can see on the curve is that as flood elevation on the x-axis increases, the damage increases, which you would expect. But there's an inflection point around 12 and a half feet where the damage jumps up. So we know that there's an inflection point in here and we know that we can compare uh, different flood elevations um, to different probabilities of damage. So then we end up with a table like this that tallies all that together using the probabilistic approach that tells me that the median value, um, let's say the median economic benefit, so the net present value benefit of building a some sort of flood defense to an elevation of 10 feet is something like $52 million, um, which is which is a great benefit, especially when compared to the cost, which was on the order of, I think, $26 million. So um, this probabilistic approach gives us this kind of information that we can share with the owner, the terminal, and the cargo, uh, the, the port authority, and the terminal operators to try to make good decisions around what elevation should we build to. Now, shouldn't we just build to an elevation high enough to prevent damage? Well, if you have enough money to do it and you can justify it, but, but preventing damage completely is, is very, very expensive and maybe not worth the, the money uh, when compared with the, the return. In this case, also, we were constrained at the marine terminal and how high we could build a flood defense so as not to impede current operations. We do have to keep roll-on, roll-off operations going and other port operations. So the solution that was arrived at through this analysis and then through looking at engineering possibilities was something they call the sea curb. Um, it's a very low flood wall that goes around the perimeter of the terminal um, and is permanently anchored in place for most of its reach, but involves some gaps that are open almost all the time, but can be filled with um, gravity, gravity stable concrete blocks during a flood event. So we plug those roll on roll off ramps uh, with deployable elements during flood events. And then there were some special allowances made around the bollards uh, along the perimeter so that those could be protected as well. So the end of that story is that this was an analysis that was used to successfully help the owner of the terminal understand the more than just a couple of numbers benefit cost, a wide range of benefit cost possibilities so they can make their preferred decision on how to invest their money, but also then to present the uh, numbers to agencies, federal agencies that might help them fund the project. So if we take that same, there's other kinds of infrastructure that rely on sea level rise. 
and I was thinking about this one in my in my design experience with breakwaters. So we design very large breakwaters to protect harbors, um, either from s extreme storm damage. More often, we design breakwaters to protect harbors uh, from daily operational wave action. We want to create quiet harbors uh, for um, floating storage recovery units, for other operations. And the design of a breakwater for wave management, wave transmission management, wave quiescence, is that you know the core and some of the other layers really dampen the waves as it comes through the breakwater. So if we designed a breakwater like this with large waves on the your left side, uh, waves coming in from the ocean on the left side, coming through the breakwater, we want a very small wave amplitude on the on the inside. And when the water level is low enough, that works well. But what if over time sea level rise raises that water level so that the core is overwhelmed and waves are coming over the top of the breakwater? Then you don't have the operational condition you want on the inside. And it can be quite expensive to retrofit a breakwater years after the fact. So we really like to consider sea level rise um, during design. And we don't want to get stuck on exactly which number should we use. So I think there is a way to consider um, sea level rise probabil probabilistically in breakwater design. I, I do think it gets a little complicated. So there's other way, other things we need to look at to be able to fully apply a probabilistic approach to breakwater design because wave transmission is not a, a super linear uh, process. So this is something I hope to explore in the future on some projects I haven't done. It's a, it's a thought process right now or a thought experiment. But I do think that um, doing a probabilistic analysis on, on breakwater design might lead you to current breakwater cross-section, for example, maybe one with a crown wall or something non-permeable non to waves. So let's see, how much time do I have? Do you think? Five minutes? Okay, good. Right, so other things we can, we can use it for. Um, it's not always the flood level that matters. Sometimes it's operation of, um, of a gate or some sort of barrier. Let's say you have a river flood barrier system or a storm surge gate barrier system and we know that we need to close it when water levels are gonna be at a certain elevation. Um, but we have to start closing it before we get there. We can't let the flood level get very high and then close it, it takes some time. So we close it on a lower elevation and then it has to stay closed for some duration um, to, to have its effect. But these are natural systems. So when we close off a natural system with a storm surge barrier or a floodgate, we are somewhat affecting that system and hopefully not adversely but there is some duration probably that um, we need to think about what that effect is. And so again, thinking about maybe that duration in a probabilistic way using sea level rise and seeing how that duration changes over time using the, the statistical data that we have, I think could be very useful. And this is an example uh, where one of my colleagues looked at that in uh, New York Harbor in New York City as part of some work he's doing there. So again, you use the analysis to decide what would the duration be um, what's the average duration going to be in one of these events? What's the average likelihood of a duration? Um, maybe of eight hours or 16 hours or 24 hours. Um, and then, but then what's the 90% confidence limit of that? Is that very different? And if it's very different, then do you need to make a different decision about how to operate the gate? So we're using these statistics not to tell us what to do, but to help us think through the possibilities and make, make good decisions. So... Uh, I guess just in my last, this is something that's a future research thing that we're trying to work on. I'll just put it out there as maybe you'll hear about it in the future. We'd like to apply the same approach to increased rainfall and being able to to look at river systems and increasing rainfall without having to run you know, many, many, many hydraulic model iterations, but being able to use stream gauge data and rating curves and maybe downscaled um, global climate change rainfalls, uh, sorry, Rainfalls from global ch climate change models downscaled to more local areas or regional areas, and then maybe assigning some probability to those different projections of rainfall to do the same sort of thing for river stage and inland waterways and inland ports. Uh, so interesting conclusion, um, there's a lot of uncertainty around sea level rise and other climate change factors. Uh, something Pianc has reported on a few times uh, I think there's ways not to get stuck in that uncertainty. We, we recognize it. We find uh, logical and or heavily mathematical ways to deal with it and try to carve it out into uh, manageable bits of data that we can look at, think through with ourselves, with project owners and stakeholders, and come to make good decisions on sort of no regret options or low regret options, things we know we can do 
that have a reasonable likelihood of, of being a success both now and decades to the future while leaving some room to adapt. And again, these, these statistics help us make those decisions. Um, there's some additional research that's needed. We, we definitely need more, uh, we need more coverage of likelihood data or probabilistic data to be able to do this analysis. It's available in the US, it's not available everywhere. But we also need um, more research on uh, what those likelihoods really are and trying to tighten that, that window up a bit and then creating those curves for rainfall and other factors. So thank you for your attention. And I guess we have a minute or two for questions, maybe. Maybe not. All right. And again, sorry for the no plant, no uh, no nature pictures. I'll do better next time. <laughs> Thank you, Brian, and sorry for not presenting you properly. <laughs> uh, before we call again, Dan, I'm going to I'm going to try to present you properly then. Well, uh, besides being the chair of PTGCC that she already mentioned uh, in a daytime job. Uh, Dan works with the port and inland waterway sector in the UK and in Europe, advising on climate change and environmental issues. She has prepared climate change adaptation reports and strategy for several seaports, as well as contributed to strategic level European guidance on adaptation and resilient planning. So we welcome you again, Jan. <laughs> Thanks, Gerardo, and uh, hello again. <laughs> so, yeah, so my presentation, um, Brian um, men has, has provided there a case study of, of how you can take certain steps to address uncertainty. Um, and Okay, yeah. So um, what I'm going to present is a, a technical guidance note that... Uh, Piang's Permanent Task Group on Climate Change uh, prepared a year or two ago, um, looking at a variety of different strategies that you can use to deal with climate change uncertainty. And, th and those strategies will depend, among other things, on how much information is available, how much capability you have for modeling, how what the resources are, and so on. And so this document uh, takes a, an approach um, that, that tries to cover provide high level guidance on a number of different situations. The guidance followed on from uh, Piank's climate change adaptation planning um, guidance. And this, look, this was published in 2020. And it sets out a four stage approach to adaptation planning for all types of ports and, and uh, waterway facilities. Um, basically looking at scene setting, gathering your information, uh, and, uh, gathering and assessing climate information, uh, determining vulnerabilities and risks, and then looking at adaptation options. And some of you may be familiar with this document. It includes uh, uh, guidance on each of these steps. It has portfolios of measures, different types of measures that you can take in order to adapt and to strengthen resilience. But when we prepared this guidance, al almost from the outset, we realized that there were two areas that were... Uh, preventing, acting as barriers, if you like, to certain organizations taking adaptation decisions and actually implementing adaptation plans. One of those was dealing with uncertainties, which I'll talk about today. And the other is how you make the business case in adaptation and resilience when you don't really know when in the future you will realize those benefits. Um, and so that the, the business case um, how you pull information together and, and make the case for, for investment is, is the subject of a technical note that will be published later this year or early next year, and I'll present uh, on Friday in Buenos Aires. So the one I'm presenting today is the one looking at uncertainties, and what that helps port operators, port owners, port designers to do is to recognize where there are uh, sources of uncertainty and to provide some practical strategies for dealing with that uncertainty so that 
you avoid um, the par paralysis, um, decision-making paralysis that you could otherwise face when you just don't know what to do. So as Brian's presentation in illustrated quite nicely, um, we know that the climate is changing. What we don't know is how much and how quickly it will change, certainly in, in the decades from now, because that depends on how effective international um, approaches are to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and whether the political will exists to implement those approaches. Climate change also has socioeconomic and environmental consequences and there are certain tipping points or, or thresholds or trigger points that may lead to, to social changes, to migration for example, which will in turn impact on how society responds to, to, to climate change, including ports. And as Brian mentioned already, there are uncertainties in the models that we're using. And so some processes are well represented, others are represented less uh, accurately. So I have the same problem. So this is a, a figure from the previous IPCC round of reports. What I want you to look at on this particular figure is the, the difference between the year 2000 and 2050. And what you see is that in the first 10 years or so um, from now, the change is relatively, there's re relatively li little difference in the projected change between the models. As you go forward to 30 years and particularly to 50 years, then the change, there's, there's more change. And we don't know whereabouts in that spectrum we're going to be. And of course, we're designing port infrastructure that has a design life of 30, 50, sometimes 100 years. And that's why we need approaches to deal with this uncertainty. And when we look at the port ecosystem, we see that climate change can affect all parts of the port. It affects the approaches and the protective infrastructure. It, approach, it, it affects the mooring areas. It affects the, the land estate and it affects onward transport. And the effects aren't only sea level rise and extreme heat, changes in seasonal precipitation, but also things like sedimentation and, and sediment dynamics. It affects um, how hospitable areas are for invasive non-native species. It changes water chemistry, it changes biology. So climate change has a wide range of implications that we need to be thinking about when we're considering adaptation planning. Brian's pretty much covered this. Why do we use scenarios? Why, why don't we just take a single estimate and go with that? Um, Brian explained that the, the, if we look back at the uh, past events, they're becoming less useful to pre predict what will happen in the future. Um, and when we uh, look to select certain climate change scenarios, we also need to consider the relative exposure or the vulnerability of the asset that we're looking to protect. And in essence, what the guidance document concludes is that the more susceptible an asset or an operation is to changes in climate, the wider the range of scenarios we need to consider. So the guidance concludes that if we're working with a um, planning horizon for our asset or our operation of less than 10 years, then maybe recent trends can be used to identify what might happen in the near future. But with that figure that we looked at where we see the changes beyond 2030 and particularly beyond 2050, we need to be exploring a wider range of scenarios. Um, so in essence, the more, the longer the design life or the planning horizon, the more investment is involved the more sensitive the asset is, the more we need to consider the wide range of scenarios. This is a, another example, I think Brian also provided for the guidance of a, of a different way of, of, of considering this uh, range of different scenarios and, and looking at, instead of multiple points on these graphs, looking at the three or four bars, um, the, the horizontal bars, as being representative of change that will happen at some point. So at least then we have something to, to guide us. But it's not always possible to resolve 
the question uh, to deal with uncertainty only by looking at um, the statistics and looking at the the kind of graphs that, that, that Brian uh, presented, because sometimes the residual uncertainty is still high. And so what can we do in those situations where we're looking at a piece of infrastructure or an operation that's intended to have a life running into decades? The group preparing the, the technical note concluded that one of the really important um, uh, things to recognize is that we need to consider not only how can we withstand, well, what, what extreme can we withstand, but if, if we exceed that, what will happen? And what action can we take to strengthen resilience so that the, the infrastructure or the operation or the asset or the facility can resist those losses and then recover quickly? We need to think about not only physical measures, um, such as engineered redundancy, but al also structural measures. So do we have plans in place? Do we, do we know where our flood risk areas are? Are we directing development to low risk areas? Have we got contingency plans in place? Are they well communicated to all the port staff or the, the, the waterway staff? Um, are, we, uh, are we clear what our thresholds are and that do we have early warning systems in place to tell us when those thresholds are likely to be uh, exceeded? So these are all improvements that we can make for to, to strengthen our adaptive capacity. The, the PIANT guidance that I mentioned at first, Working Group 178, has tables of measures in, and those measures are arranged according to whether they're structural or technological, whether they're social, behavioral, or operational, and also whether they're institutional, because in some cases, um, the, the impact of, a, of climate change on the port can maybe be managed by um, policy measures, or policy measures can contribute, economic measures can contribute. So we need to think not only about physical infrastructure, but also operations and behavior. We need to think about whether we can design structures to fail gracefully instead of catastrophically. So we might be putting in place measures uh, to, to manage the consequences in terms of sacrificial components or in terms of uh, flood proofing, for example, in the area behind the defense. And so the guidance includes a couple of examples. Um, this one, um, the bulk, uh, Lucinda bulk sugar terminal in Australia, where the original structure was affected by a tropical cyclone. And the way that the structure failed meant that the, um, there was damage to the steel wharf structure. And so when this replacement was uh, redesigned, instead of just reinstating what was there originally, the design included the development of a hierarchy of structural capacity so that the in future, the deck will fail before the wharf itself is damaged. So then when you go to recover afterwards, you're replacing the deck and not having to deal with a, a complete structural failure. So that incorporation of sacrificial elements, whether it's this kind of um, structure or indeed more simple uh, structures, jetty structures, where you maybe have a wooden deck, which you allow the wooden deck to fail and replace afterwards, or where you can take components away when you have a storm warning to store and then replace after the event. So we need to start thinking about how we can be more flexible and imaginative in these designs. The idea of failing gracefully, designing to fail so that we control the consequences, that we know, for example, where flood water is going to go, so that we know, so that we, within the flood risk area, we bund or we raise critical assets. Um, simple flood proofing measures. All of these things can be combined with um, your initial infrastructure design. And that may enable you to accept relatively more risk because the assets that would be affected are protected as a kind of secondary measure. And then the other thing we need to think about when we're designing systems or introducing new operations 
is what happens if there are joint occurrences? What happens if there are cascading failures? What are the interdependencies between the, the asset and the, the system it supports? And what are the knock-on consequences? And then finally, we can take an approach which, which we say, well, we don't know exactly what the conditions will be in 50 or 100 years. We can't necessarily afford to design, as Brian was suggesting, something significant at the moment. But can we somehow within the design make provision to strengthen or raise or elevate or modify in another way at a later date? And so this example from Germany shows where the, um, this was a, an embankment that was built, the climate dike. The yellow shows the original design. But what you see on the right hand side is that there's an area of, of land that is purchased and maybe also foundations built so that as conditions change over time, this structure can be raised and strengthened and widened to accommodate uh, greater greater floods, greater sea levels, and so on. And that means you can defer the additional expenditure until the point in the future at which you need it, but that you've made provision, for example, by land purchase or by the design of the foundations for the structure. So this idea of designing infrastructure that we can modify in the future, rather than a once and for all decision, I think is another important strategy to deal with this uncertainty. These plans, these ideas, this flexibility, how can we set out what we do at what point? Um, many of you will be familiar probably with the idea of adaptation pathways that show um, examples of where you, uh, uh, at what point you make a decision, at what point you make a change. And those pathways are informed by monitoring results. Because with climate change, the other question, of course, is whether the, the, the climate projections, even the downscale projections, actually are what's happening to you locally. And so monitoring plays a really important role. Um, let me go back to where I was. OK, so monitoring plays a really important role. And this idea of adaptation pathways and adaptive management is really important when you're looking at long-term planning. This is an example of an adaptation pathway that we've prepared for an academic paper that members of PTGCC are putting forward at the moment. What it shows in the bottom left is a situation where your, your, um, your, your operating area is being flooded perhaps three times a year. And maybe that's happened for a while and maybe you can live with that. But at some point, as sea levels rise, you need to identify and implement uh, interim measures. And that might be um, rescheduling arrivals. It may be using alternative berths. It might be um, putting in place pump drainage systems so you can evacuate water more quickly. There will come a point that the frequency with which the berth is, the operating area is inundated becomes less acceptable. And you need to look at investigations into the longer term. And what this uh, figure suggests is you might look at three options. You might look at retrofitting, you might look at replacing, or you may look at relocating. And so you need to decide whether or not the, the, the condition of the infrastructure is such that you can retrofit in a way that will last, in this case, uh, will see you through 25 years and beyond. Um, the, the condition of the infrastructure may not be sufficient or the design knife may not be long enough to do that. So you may want look to replace it. Before you take a decision to replace, you also need to consider that if you invest in the replacement of that, um, of that berth, of the, of, the, of the handling area and so on, um, is, is road transport still going to be available? Is your, are your road access routes also going to be impacted by that sea level rise? because there may be a situation in which you need a transformational change rather than just an incremental change, and you actually need to relocate the facility because you could invest a lot of money in, in replacing it, but then you find that the access roads are under a metre of water and the, and the traffic still can't get in, so you still lose this increasing number of days per year. So the adaptation pathway shows 
from getting where you are at the moment to where you want to be. And the implementation of each of those measures will depend on monitoring. And so for a port to be looking at uh, adaptation planning, one of the key um, prerequisites is knowing what's happening. It's not enough just to know what's happening with the changing climate, but you need to know whether what is projected nationally or regionally is happening locally. What are the local trends? Because that's what determines when you need to take action. What is the condition of your physical assets? Uh, because that will help you decide when a response is needed and whether something like retrofitting is worthwhile. Um, you need the information about extreme weather events to be able to validate uh, Im impact zones or models of future conditions. You need to collect data about the costs and consequences of damage and disruption, because it's those costs and consequences, the damage, the disruption, the delays, and everything that goes with that, it's avoiding those damages that helps you justify offset, if you like, the investment in the interventions that you need to make. And you need to know about the performance of measures once they're implemented to know if that's the right thing to do and whether you should do more of them. So monitoring is really key as a first step on the adaptation planning route, having the data to inform the decisions about what to do and when. So overall, then, the key messages from the technical note, um, I think that project owners, designers um, can reduce risks in this uncertain future by using scenarios, by reducing reliance on past data. Um, oh, I didn't mention this earlier, but by considering unlikely but plausible scenarios. So if you're looking at very big investments, the what if, not necessarily using that to inform design, but what would happen if this structure failed? What would happen if you got this magnitude of event? Are you prepared for that as well? Um, and that also applies to cascading failures and joint occurrences. But then this question of adopting, implementing adaptive and flexible solutions so that you recognize that you can't deal with all this uncertainty. So you need to be able to respond, modify things in the future. You need evaluation methods that work with all that. And then you have a problem if you're using high discount rates, for example. So you might want to look at multi-criteria methods rather than straight benefit cost analysis, something else that's covered in the, in the guidance and the importance of monitoring and data. So it's a bit of a whistle stop tour of the, of the guidance, both working group one to 10, eight and this new technical note on dealing with uncertainties. But hopefully you can see that it's what it's trying to do is to give you some pr pragmatic routes and pragmatic solutions in a situation where, where there might otherwise be a big question about what you do and you might end up doing nothing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're talking about you know very hardened infrastructure, but um, but the tools that you describe seem very nicely attuned to nature-based solutions because those are more dynamic, and you really can build up slowly, and you can adapt and monitor. So when you're worried about 25 versus 75 centimeters of sea level rise, perhaps for if you're managing wetlands, you don't have to know that exact answer now, but you can adapt and proceed and really create a plan. But I think, I don't know if you've seen these tools that you're talking about also be extended into more nature-based features. So I, I wouldn't have a specific example about nature-based features, but what I do know from discussing with um, other sectors and the international fora is that this approach is it, it works pretty much in all situations. We talk a lot to people about road and rail. And, and, and so I think it applies to most types of infrastructure, but, but in that kind of context, I'm not limiting infrastructure to hard solutions. You know, so, so when you look in fact at the, at the portfolios of measures in the guidance document, they include both hard and soft um, infrastructure solutions. 
um, because there's, there's a physical element to them as opposed to only behavioral or institutional. So, so absolutely, yes. I mean, I, 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 I can't help you with an example, maybe Brian can, but the, the, the theory, absolutely. Yeah, I presented it in terms of ports, but when the road and rail guys listen, it's like, yeah, you know what, that's the same for us. Yeah, so the I haven't applied a specific approach like this to a nature-based project, but I can see, I can see the value in 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 allowing room for not being right about the number, like allowing room for uncertainty. If we think about a wetland or a living shoreline or something like that, a very large marsh, it needs room to migrate with sea level rise. Yes, we want to try to do uh, possible thin layer placement and keep up with the tide levels rising because the plants in a certain area will thrive in a certain water elevation zone and they won't thrive when they're submerged, they'll change to something else. So I think maybe an application would be when planning out a large environmental restoration, like a, like a marsh planting or, you know, living shoreline or something, uh, using these kinds of thought processes to allow more room for it to migrate over time, uh, managing, even if it's, even if it's a long-term vision to manage development over time, you know, maybe you have a certain development now, but you think it might change over time. Building that into the plan, I think, could be very useful. Actually, actually, it's for you, Brian, uh, from your position. Uh, he says, to consider uncertainty, do you only use Monte Carlo simulation, or do you also use other strategies so such two level stochastic optimization. It's an easy answer for me because I'm not I'm not personally the statistician. So um, I think that would be something I'd have to go talk to my colleagues who actually did the programming um, and and think. I'm sorry. I wish I could answer that. It sounds like something I'd, I'd like to know, but I don't know that part of statistics. I'm sorry. Well, then we continue to to our next presenter, um, Jessica Alvarez. Uh, she's a managing consultant at Rambo uh, with 12 years of experience in quality consulting, specializing on emission control strategy and mobile source of technolo technology for marine ports. Also, she currently works works for Rambo in decarbonization team to help the transportation and other industry clients meet their climate and sustainability goals. So, okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Gerardo, and thanks everybody for hearing for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm excited to share to share some of the work that we do um, at Rumble on climate action plans and lessons in decarbonizing U.S. ports. So let me try this. Okay, so I'm going to cover um, some work that we did with the Port of Vancouver in Washington State and the Port of Longview in Washington State on climate action plans. These are ports that are located in the Columbia River between Oregon and Washington State, so not the Port of Vancouver in Canada, if that's what you were thinking. And uh, I'll also share some of the work that we've been doing over the years with the Port of Los Angeles and, and some of the lessons we learned from that. So I think it's important to understand the regulatory setting that is driving ports in the US to you know, reduce their emissions and, and to address their impact to climate change. Um, so the federal government has set net zero targets to 2050 and other states like California and Washington have done so as well. So what you have here is a chart uh, that shows in the Y axis, the percent of baseline emissions and you have the years through 2050 in the bottom. And what it's trying to show is that 
you see these boxes, these are different targets. Um, and over time, um, you know, there are a fraction lower of the baseline emissions. So the most aggressive target uh, right now is the 95% below 1990 levels by 2050, and that's the current federal and Washington state target. And basically ports are following these targets as a guideline for them to you know, set a target of their own and to reduce emissions relative to a baseline that they set for themselves. So the process for developing a climate action plan um, kind of is described here. And um, there's typically what we're seeing, there's two tracks that might be included in a climate action plan. So you could have a climate mitigation plan, uh, a track that is about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And that's the most common. But then you can also have a climate adaptation track, which is about improving the port's resiliency to climate hazards and reducing the risk of those hazards. Um, so in order to develop these climate action plans, you know, the first thing is you, you start by defining a baseline. And that might look like developing an emissions inventory, or it might look about, you know, uh, understanding the conditions of your physical asset in case of a climate adaptation track. And from what you learn from defining the baseline, then you move on to brainstorming ideas, and this could be a collaborative effort between, you know, port staff and stakeholders and community members to uh, find uh, measures and actions that could be taken to address those things uh, found in the baseline. So, you know, the, the measures get screened and shortlisted, and um, they can be further evaluated. And all of this gets uh, summarized in a document called the CAP document. So I might refer to a, as, a, uh, as a CAP to the climate action plans. Uh, you might hear me say that. So this CAP document basically serves as a roadmap for the adoption and the implementation of the whole plan. And it's something that typically is publicly available and you know uh, the community can also be involved. Okay, so you you might be wondering, you know, uh, why develop a climate action plan or strategy um, besides, you know, the idea of obviously reducing the impact of climate change from port operations. And there are different economical reasons uh, that you, you know, ports might want to uh, embark in this climate action plan. Things like preserving the natural resources. Um, that the port relies on for continued business success. But also having a, plan, uh, uh, a cap allows to attract customers that are prioritizing environmental practices. And in terms of climate adaptation, it can help protect the local economy um, from negative impacts of weather events that could disrupt the business severely. And then um, there's ways to do these climate action plans in a way that is financially responsible. And so that you can invest in actions that are you know, providing both uh, cost operational savings as well as environmental return. Um, so the first example I wanna share is this project that we did with the Port of Long, uh, uh, Vancouver in Washington State, as I mentioned earlier. And this is a port that has about five terminals. Uh, it's a river facing port, similar to here in, Bah in Bahia Blanca. They're upstream uh, the Columbia River. And they have operations of automobile imports, break bulk. And we helped them develop their first climate action plan. And so um, that helped them sort of set a roadmap for you know, establishing policies that they could use to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So as I mentioned earlier, the first step towards that is developing a emissions inventory. And you know, the port of uh, Vancouver already had a 2005 inventory um, and we worked with them to develop a 2019 inventory um, that you can see in the chart here. So you, know, you have the greenhouse gas emissions per year and the different type of sources that they included in their inventory. So things like their vehicle fleet, their equipment fleet, uh, you know, it could be construction or cargo handling, 
uh, stationary sources of combustion like diesel and natural gas and the usage of electricity for, for operations. And so these sources of emissions, they can be qualified in three buckets. And these are scope one and two, and then scope three. So scope one and two refer to sources that are port control or owned by the port. Um, and scope three are, are related to sources that are more uh, out of the port's direct control uh, that could be upstream or downstream of the port. So things like the tenant activities, the marine vessels, um, the uh, you know uh, waste, uh, waste and water usage, uh, and so things of that nature. So the Port of Vancouver decided to focus first on the scope one and two categories that they have control over. And that's what you see in their inventory. So once the, the, uh, the emission sources have been identified in the baseline, um, and, you, and you know sort of, sort of what are your major sources, what are your smaller sources, then um, there is a brainstorming of actions that can be developed to uh, you know, tackle those, those different sources. And so what you have here is sort of what that looks like. Um, this is a, you know, some examples of some of the measures that we work to develop with the Port of Vancouver. Um, and basically, you can develop measures um, and, I, and then evaluate them in different, in different aspects. So the investment cost, the greenhouse gas reduction potential, implementation timeline, and also identifying co-benefits that might come from these measures. So those co-benefits could be things like operational cost savings, um, water conservation, you know, community benefits, um, et cetera. And so, you know, one of the things uh, you see here are some examples. Uh, you have uh, electrifying fossil fuel vehicles and equipment and energy efficiency retrofits. Um, also encouraging visits to cleaner or more, more fuel efficient vessels. And all of these have different investment costs and greenhouse gas reduction potential. So basically ports use these, you know, uh, these process to uh, understand how they can pr prioritize these actions and how they want to, they might be able to implement them over time. So after identifying the actions that the ports want to pursue, um, we, you know, we help them quantify the emissions reductions that are associated with those actions. So what you have here is a, a chart for the Port of Vancouver um, project where if you look at the line in the middle, the purple line, that's the 2005 baseline. So that's their initial level of emissions. Um, which are here in the y axis in the y axis right and you have the years at the bottom and so you can see that uh, there's also a red line at the top and that's what emissions will look like if they didn't take further action from what they're doing today so that will be like their business as usual level and you can see that it grows a little bit above the baseline um, but they have set a target of net zero that they want to meet that is aligned with the federal and the and the government, um, the Washington state government by 2050. So in, or, in order to see if they can get to that target, which is in the black line at the bottom, um, you know, we help them quantify what is the potential reduction of all their measures over time. So you can see in these color wedges, they're basically the reductions from those actions. And you have, uh, you know, promoting renewable energy, pursuing energy, efficiency retrofits among others and also the way that they're organized here they're organized from like low cost to high cost and so you can see that for instance promoting renewable energy use has a high uh, greenhouse gas reduction potential uh, but not the highest cost so it's one of the most cost effective measures in their plan um, and you can also learn from this chart that you know Ports might be able to uh, get to a level with the actions that they select, and there might be a gap to get to the target. And you know that gap, uh, there's a, 
a way to fill that gap is using carbon offsets, which is something that they have decided to pursue. So the next example I wanna share with you is this uh, project with the Port of Longview, also in Washington State. It's very close to the Port of Vancouver. Um, it's about nine terminals and they also did a climate action strategy, which is just another name for climate action plan. And they had a climate adaptation track in it. And so in that, you know, um, we helped them do a climate hazard exposure and impact assessment. And, you know, this is very similar to what Jan and Brian were talking about. This is a sort of a screening level initial analysis that you can use to identify hazards that could present a present day threat or a future day threat to the port. Um, and so each of the different climate hazards you see here, things like extreme heat, extreme rainfall, flooding, um, they are analyzed and ranked in different, um, in different levels. So you can see them at the bottom and you know, you have, uh, they're, they're run from zero to four. So you can see zero basically represents uh, low like no exposure, no risk. Um, and then you have, uh, you know, level one, which is something like, you know, there's a low exposure. Level two is there's low exposure, but some potential uh, risk. So recommended, uh, monitoring is recommended, which, you know, Janet was talking about the importance of monitoring. And then you have level three, which is, you know, uh, there's a, a high exposure and the adaptation strategies may be necessary or the, the risk needs to be studied further. So you will do things like the studies that Brian was talking about with sea, lo sea level rise, where, you know, there's a more in-depth study for that specific climate hazard. And so you can see here, you know, that the, the exposure might change over time in the time horizon for each, for each hazard. And, and they're also evaluated in terms of confidence, uh, which speaks to the, to the certainty of the model data available and the magnitude of the impact, which uh, it speaks to the need for action, depending on the type of, of, of risk level. So once you've done the initial climate exposure assessment, uh, which is more a, at a geographical level and poor why, um, you can do a vulnerability assessment. And this one, um, in this one, basically, you we work with the port to list all their physical assets. So you have things, uh, you know, the, the land facing, uh, the land upland assets, and you have the water-based uh, assets. And uh, we do something called a criticality assessment, which is, uh, evaluating if one of these assets were to fail because of a climate hazard, how bad would it be? You know, and that could go from minor to catastrophic. So, you know, uh, after that, you cope, you couple that with a the results of the climate change um, hazard analysis, and basically, you know, you assign a vulnerability of each asset um, to the climate hazards. And that helps you identify which hazards, which sorry, which assets are actually uh, a higher risk, and that you might want to uh, pursue actions to plan ahead and avoid, you know, uh, a major disruption of business in the future. So here are some examples of um, climate adaptation measures that you know, were used in the Port of Longview project um, that came from their initial, you know, uh, hazard screening analysis. Um, and, you know, they're looking at things like um, investing in heat tolerant equipment and uh, in infrastructure, right? Um, also looking at sustainable drainage systems and nature-based stormwater management systems um, and about upgrading and, ins and installing uh, flood defenses. So, you know, similar to the greenhouse gas measure analysis, like each of these 
uh, adaptation measures can be further evaluated in terms of the extent, in terms of their cost and timeline. So for this particular project, the mitigation extent will go from you know, improving the risk response to removing the risk altogether. And then the cost range you know, uh, could go from $25,000 to you know, $25 million projects, depending on what they're, they're trying to pursue. So you can, you can see that some um, measures like uh, investing in heat tolerant infrastructure for instance, has a relatively low cost for them, and but it could accrue, uh, you know, a, a large level of mitigation extent by reducing risk. So it's one of the more cost-effective measures that they they identify. Um, next, I wanted to share a little bit also about uh, the work that we've done with the Port of Los Angeles. Um, you know, the Port of Los Angeles is one of the largest ports worldwide, and we have, um, over the years, uh, helped them with um, their environmental impact reports, which is something that they need uh, for CEQA. So CEQA is the California environmental law that requires the port and, and many major developments that if there is a construction and terminal expansion, they need to evaluate what are the environmental impacts of of those projects and if feasible if they they need to mitigate uh, any impacts to different different types of um, areas either air quality greenhouse gases you know biology water etc and so we work with the port of la um, in you know different types of terminals evaluations like container terminals marine oil terminals bulk and we're seeing what they have been implementing over the years so um, one of the things that uh, you know they're really leading is um, these uh, technology um, implementation of, of different equipment uh, at their port so you know they're working to uh, electrify cargo handling equipment um, and using alternative fuels uh, like LNG and propane instead of diesel power fuel. Um, they're also being uh, working to implement uh, shore power connection at birth, which those might, might not be sure that entails basically that th when the vessels are hoteling, you, you know, they, they plug into the grid uh, in, and the auxiliary en engines are turned off instead of you know, running uh, while at birth. And so that's another measure they've been doing, uh, installing vessel speed reductions, um, which, you know, they're a front-facing port, so they have sort of more liberty of the speed that they will take, but that if you set a, a speed limit, it actually helps lower um, fuel consumption and emissions. And they're also been working to encourage of their dredged trucks. Um, you know, by replacing with either zero emission trucks or lowering their emitter models, uh, lower emitter models, um, or maybe alternative ones with natural gas. Um, and of course, uh, idling reduction um, has been a, a sort of low hanging fruit they're also been pursuing. So some of the key takeaways that I wanted to share with you from this work, um, it's the energy trends um, that we've seen in, you know, their carbonization of ports. And, I, you know, you've seen some of these in the previous slides, uh, some of the ideas that ports are implementing nowadays. Uh, ca they can basically be, um, they can be categorized in these two groups, a scope one and two, as I mentioned earlier, the ones that the port has control over, and then a scope three, the ones that are um, more uh, directed for tenants. And so in scope one, you have things like developing sustainable design and construction standards. So, you know, that speaks to what many of you were talking earlier, and Jan and, and Brian too, about, you know, designing with the idea of, you know, sustainability. And then, um, you know, pursuing energy efficiency retrofits, 
uh, promoting renewable energy use, as these are some of the scope one and two actions that they've been taking. Um, and in terms of scope three, those actions really are about encouraging and supporting tenants uh, at ports to be able to kind of come along and and be part of the of the reduction process. So you know there could be things like providing incentives for low carbon marine operations, uh, or you know uh, setting penalties for excessive idling. Um, and, you know, obvious things like reducing solid waste and, and water usage. Um, and then I guess finally, you know, uh, the key, the key ideas I think that I want you, you know, I want you all to take home is um, some of the things that we're seeing is that it might look very overwhelming. There's so many options to but ports can start small and you know uh, you can lead by example by doing uh, you know uh, just the things that are within scope one and two uh, sources so that's that's one option uh, that many ports are taking um, just starting with what they can control and you know I considering involving government to finance and incentivize uh, the energy transition is important. I mean, after all, ports are part of the local economy. Um, and so, you know, it's something that ports are working, collaborating with governments to be able to finance these type of projects. Um, and, you know, as this was mentioned today earlier, it's important to understand the climate risks and to take early action either in design or in planning, and that could be part of, a of, of any climate action plan. Um, and understanding that also these climate action plans uh, allow you to remain competitive in the current market where ESG, um, for those who might not know environmental social governments, is a very uh, you know, popular um, tr trending uh, pursued for many companies nowadays that they're setting their own, you know, their, their own goals and they will want to, you know, business with people and ports that have similar goals. Um, and, you know, uh, some of the co-benefits that, um, that I mentioned earlier, and I think are important, you know, are that you get an immediate improvement to local air quality and health risk when you invest in these climate action plans. Um, and, and resource conservation as well. So, you know, it, it helps to also uh, access all these other benefits and it might open opportunities for funding through these other benefits. Um, and challenges need to be acknowledged early on. So, you know, one of the main obvious ones uh, being cost uh, and, and initial capital investment, uh, but there might also be challenges related to operational feasibility and you know, uh, you know the type of technology that you're implementing. So, with these challenges, like there's opportunities for innovation, and so you, you know, ports might want to uh, prioritize actions where they can lower the fuel and operational costs, as well as improving overall overall operational efficiency. Um, and there's also opportunities to do this through. Uh, I think somebody mentioned earlier, pilot projects or small demonstration projects where you can test these new technologies and you can show your commitment to change and, you know, there's um, ways to sort of test the waters on, on these approaches. Um, so that's all I had. Thank you for your time. And yeah, let me know if you have any questions. This is working, that's better. So just picking up on this issue of co-benefits, I think that's really interesting. But I was wondering whether whether in any of these projects the co-benefits have been quantified and and or even without quantification, whether those benefits have made the difference between 
certain choices or implementing actually implementing something that would otherwise be implemented because i think when you look at climate adaptation in particular in some cases the co-benefits are massive but the initial impression is that the adaptation is not is, isn't value for money for whatever reason and and, and i think this whole question of you know, stepping up the profile of co-benefits, of, of quantifying them, including them in the in the equation, so that you're um, because because the consequences of inaction on the other side of the uh, coin. You know, you mentioned about affecting local communities and so on. And I just wonder whether the ports you're working with, how far the issue of co-benefits is going beyond just a kind of tick box exercise because of CSR or um, ESG or whatever actually into being something meaningful? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, certainly there are projects and port projects that we are also quantifying the co-benefits um, because, you know, uh, certain ports uh, suffer from like local air quality issues. And so for them, it's as important to show that there is, you know, they're, they're committed to climate change, which is a topic that, you know, is, ev is in everyone's mind, but also that, you know, there is this pressing pro uh, problem with the local air quality. So there's, there's emissions inventories that are done that include the criteria pollutants, as well as like, there are some projects that call for, there's a, 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 a theme in the US right now that's really important, which is the environmental justice component of projects and so there the, some of these climate action plans sometimes that have an environmental justice component where there's analysis you can uh, you can do uh, modeling analysis to see the effect of you know reducing emissions and how they impact you know uh, disadvantaged communities so there's definitely a, a lot of that happening as well So I was thinking about the uh, scope one and scope scope one and two and three benefits. So scope one and two are the things that the port controls. Mm -hmm. They're direct mm -hmm. operations. Scope three might be, they're very much out of their control. Could it be subcontractors or, you know, their operations or their clients? Mm -hmm. um, but it dawns on me, and this may be more of a comment, but the the port and their operations they are the scope three benefits for all of the other um, for their for their tenants. So if their tenants are pursuing uh, positive impacts on climate change, and they want to see improved scope three, they want to see their clients who are the port to have a better operations. Then they will be very much incentivized by ports who are kind of taking these actions. I don't know if you are in this conversation perhaps with ports or if this if this is one of the incentives too for them mm -hmm. to, to move forward besides you know some of the regulatory goals that we have. Yeah, certainly. I mean there are like shipping companies out there that have their own, you know, ESG goals and you know they are looking for collaboration with the ports that they're operating with to make that happen. So, you know, we, we're working with some shipping companies and they are they, they work with the ports to like help establish like the shore power, you know, ability um, at ports. And and so there's definitely a lot of that. And, uh, you know, you will be able as a port to maybe attract new customers as you are doing, you know, some of these actions because there's people that are prioritizing that out there and trying to find the best the best channel to to implement their own plans. Yeah. I, I would love to see the data, the monitoring data coming out of Port of Los Angeles uh, because uh, I, I get a sense that, uh, that, that some of those measures are having a very positive impact, particularly on, on air quality, uh, because I, I believe you have the communities are the local communities is the next door neighbor. And I think some of those local communities are uh, environmental justice communities. 
And uh, I think we're seeing tangible benefits almost immediately are related to their decarbonization uh, measures. So I was wondering if you could uh, comment on, on that a little bit in terms of how successful, uh, particularly the Port of LA is so far in implementing those measures. Yeah, um, they have, well, they put out a uh, annual inventory. Um, so you can see their progression on, on lowering the emissions. Um, but they, they have been successful in implementing a lot of these. Some of them are starting. So for instance, the Dreyer's truck fleet conversion is something that, you know, it's, it's sort of a scope three for them because they don't own the fleet. And so they have to work with government and, and sort of figure out ways that they can promote that. So sometimes they do things like, uh, you know, establishing priority lanes for electric trucks. Um, and, and so they kind of start with those small steps. Um, and yeah, they have been successful in the shore power. A lot of the, the success also is coming from the regulatory setting as well, because you know, in California you have the shore power rule, um, they are starting to uh, implement uh, the, the truck fleet conversion standards, which will help you know, in the future, like by 2035, you know, the trucks need to be electric. So, so some of those things are gonna be regulatory driven and the port tries to, you know, help the tenants sort of get there um, in, in a way they can, so. Okay, and with that is the last one of the third session, so I invite you to our last coffee break, and uh, we'll be back here in half an hour.
the uh, the energy transition in the port of Antwerp and Bruges. But first of all, um, let me tell you something more about our port. Um, so we actually recently uh, went through a merger of the port of Antwerp and the port of Bruges. They are both located um, at the North Sea in Belgium. And the energy transition actually was one of the main reasons for the uh, merger of the two ports together. I will come back to that in a second, but I think this was an important slide for people across understand where uh, our port is located. Um, we are a very important energy port in uh, Europe. Uh, more precisely, we are the uh, largest chemical cluster in Europe. And this is a very important uh, aspect because this shows why uh, we also play a very important role in the energy transition because we are already a a uh, large energy hub now, albeit in fossil fuels. So we have uh, a huge responsibility as a port authority to uh, take the leading role in this energy transition. You can see some, uh, some numbers on the screen, but I will not go through them right now. But I think the most important one is the one on the right bottom. Um, and yeah, as you know, with the war in Ukraine uh, and Russia, um, the uh, the provision of energy in Europe was not so stable, um, and we see now the importance of a, a port authority in this energy geopolitical importance, and 15% of all the EU gas passes by our port which is right now primarily liquid natural gas. And in the future, this has to be a clean fuel. So that also shows the importance of the energy transition in Europe. Here you can see an, an aerial view of our uh, LNG terminal. Um, we supply, as I said, 15% of the EU with our LNG from Bruges and a lot of this gas gets consumed in Antwerp where the chemical industry is located and also a lot of it is being passed to the German market where also a lot of chemical industry is and they have less access to ports because uh, all their ports are in the north of the country that's why for some parts of Germany, it is more interesting to import their gas from Belgium. And then, as I said, in Europe, we have uh, the biggest chemical cluster of Europe and the second biggest in the world after Houston in Texas. You can see a list of the companies that are active in uh, Antwerp. And this showcases the, the, the opportunity we have when combining the strengths of these two ports. We see on the one hand in Bruges that we can import a lot of energy, uh, be it LNG or uh, maybe hydrogen or ammonia. And in Antwerp, we have a lot of consumption. We have a lot of chemistry, chemical uh, companies that need a lot of energy. Right now they need uh, gas or oil or coal, but in the future they will need ammonia or hydrogen or green methanol to fuel their uh, feedstock. Now, if we take a step back, to the Belgian markets and the Belgian energy transition. Um, we see that we need as a country 
as and we are a very small country, 500 terawatt hours um, for our consumption of energy. And this entails, as you see, um, the heating of buildings, which is the red block on the bottom, but also the fuel for uh, all types of uh, vessels or cars and for electricity. So in total, the whole energy consumption is 500 terawatt hours. And you can see that uh, almost all of it is originated from uh, oil, gas. Only our electricity is um, not, for the most part, not few fossil, but uh, a lot of it is from nuclear or renewable. But we see that we have a, a lot of work to do still right now today. And the picture on the right shows you geographically what our problem is for the future. Um, it looks like a difficult picture, but it's pretty easy. Basically, you see um, for each region in Europe how many energy that country or region consumes subtracted with how much energy it can produce themselves locally in green energy. So that shows that in the Netherlands, Belgium, but also Germany, we don't have a lot of space for uh, wind energy, for solar, because it's always rainy, it's never sunny. Um, but we have a lot of industry that needs energy. And there you can see a big deficit, meaning that we cannot produce all the energy locally that we need to fuel our industry with. So we have to import our energy um, from elsewhere in the world. And now we come to the main parts of this presentation. And I think that's what's most interesting. Um, and this is how we are going to tackle this problem of the energy transition and how we can uh, collaborate to, uh, to a green future. We have three uh, focuses. Uh, the first one is implementing local energy uh, production, wind energy and solar. The second one is uh, getting all infrastructure ready for the uh, transportation of hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives. And the third one is the import of hydrogen, because as I explained, we cannot produce in Belgium all our energy ourselves. We have to import from elsewhere in the world, just like we do today with LNG. We import it from Qatar or from USA or from Russia. In the future, we have to import hydrogen from elsewhere. First of all, the, this is of less interest because it's not so crazy new technology. This is our approach for wind energy. We have 134 wind turbines in the Port of Antwerp Bruges combined, which equals um, almost 400 megawatts. And this is almost half of one nuclear reactor with a lot of energy, uh, which is uh, directly consumed by our clients or the companies in the ports. And um, these are the best yields of Belgium because uh, in an industrial area, there is a lot of space um, and the wind energy is very efficient. And we motivate all our customers to uh, use this wind energy directly for charging their cars or for heating their buildings or for supplying their vessels of green electricity. And we as a port authority take the leading role in this development of these projects and we uh, look for new opportunities uh, when they are available. One of these examples of the usage of this green electricity in the ports 
this onshore power supply. Here you see the cruise terminal in Bruges, uh, and they are high emitters of uh, carbon dioxide, but also nitrogen or sulfur, uh, which is not good for local uh, health of the residents that live close by. And we can actually, by investing in the installation on the right-hand side, which is called uh, onshore power supply, uh, we can reduce the emissions from these vessels to zero um, when they are at birth. So this is a very, um, not easy, but it's not, not rocket science this technology, and this can help to uh, improve the quality of life in your ports by uh, a lot. Especially when you use the energy produced from the wind turbines. To give an example, the emissions of these cruise ships, these two here, they, for almost 10% of the emissions of all ships in Antwerp and Bruges combined. So these cruise ships are high emitters and that's why this uh, investment was very uh, logical for us. Then um, the second pillar is the hydrogen or the uh, new infrastructure. Um, on the left hand side, you see you see the very simple representation of how it is right now. We have our electricity, our oil, or gas that is coming in to the ports, uh, but it's all fossil fueled. And what comes out of the port is the end products produced by the chemical players and the fuels that get produced. Um, by the uh, Exxon Mobil or Total Energy uh, companies, for example. What we need to go to in the future is a lot more complex. You see that on the right hand side, a lot more color, which is already good. And besides the classical streams, we will also need hydrogen infrastructure, uh, biomass getting imported. Uh, hydrogen carriers, for example, ammonia, methanol, or others, and also CO2 infrastructure to be present at the port to be ready for the future. And if we translate this to how we can translate this to our port in Bruges and Antwerp, like I said, we will start from the left-hand side of the picture. Hydrogen and uh, clean energy is coming in from Bruges. Which it will be important, imported through our current terminal, which is now importing LNG. But in the future, it will be converted through imports of hydrogen. Then through pipelines, and this you see in the middle, it will be um, transported to Antwerp, where this green electricity from the offshore wind parks and this green hydrogen from the import terminals will be used by the chemical cluster. And they will then um, transport their uh, final products through the rest of Europe and mainly Germany through uh, pipeline, but also through barge or through rail. And in that way, we can be ready for the future. And it is a big challenge, but uh, um, we are working with all types of governments and stakeholders to be ready and to have the first of these hydrogen pipelines and ammonia import terminals ready by 2027.
so already right now we are um, having engineering and permitting started to be ready by 2027 to have these pipelines and these new types of infrastructure ready for our clients. And then what is very important is uh, where we will uh, import this hydrogen from. Um, because as I said, in Antwerp, there is not enough sun or not enough wind to meet all our, our uh, energy demands in the country. That's why we have to import it. But where will we import it from? Um, as you noticed the last years, it is not smart to focus on one country, namely Russia, to import all your energy from. That's why we had have uh, investigated the potential of other uh, countries to import our uh, energy from. And we have right now uh, bilateral agreements with some countries all over the world where we will import hydrogen, ammonia, or methanol from. Our most concrete projects right now are in Chile, in uh, Brazil, Porto Chu, in Namibia, and in Oman. But as you can see, a lot of other countries are being investigated as well. And we have right now selected these countries based on their uh, wind energy and solar energy potential, but also on their geopolitical stability of the country and on the uh, place and the space that the port authority can offer for these projects, because for generating this kind of amount of energy, we need a lot of space and place that is cheap uh, to import from. And the idea, for example, for Namibia is that uh, we, as Port of Antwerp Bruges, will co invest in the infrastructure there locally. And we import the hydrogen that is produced there. And I will show you on this next picture how we intend to do it. So from left up, you see the, for example, in Namibia, the sun and wind production, which is there present all year round. Then electrolysis will take place in Namibia, which will be convert the electricity to hydrogen. Then the synthesis will take place to transform the hydrogen into, for example, ammonia, because ammonia is energy denser and it is way easier to ship ammonia to Belgium than to ship hydrogen. Then you will see on the bottom, it will be transported and then stored in Antwerp where it will be transported to the end users via pipeline. And we have, uh, we did this with some uh, partners like NG, XMR, they may all internationally uh, very known companies that helped us to develop this strategy. And um, by doing this, we guarantee that we have enough uh, green molecules ready for um, companies and for whole nest northwestern Europe because we see that uh, we cannot produce it ourselves in our region. Um, and I think that concludes my presentation uh, because uh, uh, I think it was about half an hour, so I if you have any questions, I will put on my email on the screen and you can always uh, contact me if you have some uh, questions. So. Okay. Um...
Thank you, Idris. Uh, is there a question in the floor? Yes, uh, Martin. Try to the other one. Hello, hello, Dry. Uh, congrats for your presentation. It was very clear. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Why uh, Argentina is not on your map? Uh, I have two questions. And <laughs> big one. I, I, I will talk later about uh, what we are we doing to export. Uh, hydrogen carriers in my presentation. And the, the other question is, which organization leads the energy transition planning? The Port Authority, the local government, the national government? It's so interesting for me that information. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so um, there, I have not really an answer why Argentina is not on the, on the picture. <laughs> But I'm sure that um, my colleagues, because I'm not involved directly, they uh, investigated also the opportunity um, of Argentina. Um, and maybe it was not the right time. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but maybe in the future, who knows? I know that a lot of ports in Europe are exploring all over the world. So I think the opportunity is there for every country that has enough sun or wind energy in offer. Uh, yeah. And then for the second question, the uh, energy transition is coordinated in the port by the port authority, and we are part of the uh, Flemish government. Uh, Flanders is a region in Belgium, so it's actually a regional uh, governmental body. Yeah. Thank you, Dries. Uh, any other question? Yeah, we got back there. <laughs> Can someone <laughs> hand over a microphone? <laughs> Hi, Dries, very nice presentation. Um, I was wondering, you had some flows for like now and the future through the port and you had CO2 as a flow. And I was wondering what are some of the ideas of what the port has for CO2? and utilization. Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. I did not touch the subject of CO2 because it's quite complex and we are investigating it right now um, very elaborately because um, the carbon capture and utilization or carbon capture and storage is a very important part in the energy transition as well. Um, and we have one concrete project right now with uh, a chemical player called uh, BASF, which is one of the biggest chemical players in the world. And there we have the goal to um, capture their CO2 and then transport it with an um, underground pipeline to the empty gas fields in uh, Norway. The project it's called uh, Antwerp at Sea, and we hope to catch or capture uh, half of our CO2 emissions by 2030 uh, of the whole port with it. Um, but there are some issues regarding regulation uh, because internationally CO2 is seen as uh, waste. Um, it's not seen as a molecule or as something that you can easily transport. So there, there is some regulation that has to be fine-tuned with European Union and with Belgium itself um, before we can move forward. Uh, so right now it remains more, yeah, conceptual, let's say. Yeah. But we have great projects. Yeah. Right, thank you. Thank you, Dries, for your for your lecture. Uh, anybody else? Right. Start with, well, we'll give uh, you another round of applause and thank you for, for having us. Right. right. Thank you. Okay. Bye and uh, have fun.
Right. Um, well, going on with the session. Oh, caught myself there. <laughs> right. Um, we're going to have the next uh, um, speaker is uh, Daniel Arcudero. Uh, just a sec. It's always asking. Yeah, there he is. She's a civil engineer and magister of ports and coasts. Uh, she's in the area of uh, uh, civil engineering in the uh, in the fac regional faculty of the National Technical University up here in Bahia Blanca. Also, she she has a, uh, she's professor in the National South University here also in Bahia Blanca. Uh, and well, we invite her to, to come over. Uh, she will be presenting carbon footprinting, a tool to plan energy transition in the Bahia Blanca port experience. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. This is my camera. <laughs> okay. Well. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, thank the organizer, the organizer, for inviting me to uh, participate in this meeting of the Tiang Commissions, and I would like to share with you um, the experience of the Bahia Blanca Port through uh, use uh, the carbon footprint. As a, to, as a planning tool for an energy transition. This pre uh, as you see in the slide, this presentation is structured into four sections. Um, begins with the response with the sport at the aspect of climate change. Uh, next, I will tell you about experience of the um, Port of Bahia Blanca in the, mm, in the carbon footprint estimating. Um, next, I could describe mm, how the, this uh, es carbon footprint estimation uh, as using, are using as a tool to plan the port energy transition. And um, finally, I will mention s uh, some of the main challenges that the port uh, must face. Okay. Um, as you know, for decades, scientists have been warning about the effects of climate, cl climate change uh, accelerated by the anthropogenic action. There are two types of responses to this. One is mitigation that involves in, uh, in, in actions uh, to reduce impacts, and the other is mitigation, uh, which consists in anticipating impacts and take me and propose measures and process to adapt to them. For several reasons, port and maritime transport are especially sensitive about the effect of climate change. The responses developed by this sector are as regard mitigation, uh, measure carbon footprint to uh, monitor emissions, and planning the energy transitions to replace fossil fuels uh, by um, um, 
sustainable energy. And as per adaptation, uh, identifica identify threats and resulting by the uh, temperate, global temperature increase and um, propose uh, projects or measures to increasing uh, receive to increase resilience and the uh, reduce this risk. In order to provide, um, uh, uh, in order to to provide uh, um, context to the action of port to against the climate change, uh, let's see the Nash the nation's responses uh, with the creation of the IPCC in 1988. Mm, scientists agreed on the uh, impact uh, of the of the anthropogenic uh, impact to the climate change. But it was uh, only since uh, 2015 that with the Paris Agreement that countries uh, have making more important commitment to reduce their emissions. The same year, the United Nations um, approved the mm, 2030 Agenda and financing flows and policies began to align to sustainable development and a disaster clim climate change risk reduction. In Argentina, two acts mark the began the began uh, the begin to the action to the national act to the nation national actions to against the effects of climate change. Mm. In 2016, the Paris Agreement was ratified, and in 2019, the, um, the legal framework, framework to um, uh, climate change policies uh, was set in accordance with uh, in accordance uh, with the um, international commitment assumed in Argent Argentina um, no it is sorry the, the first national GHG inventory uh, was presented in 2020 and the second in 2022. Mm, however, Argentina uh, GHG emissions uh, are not significant. Uh, these actions uh, demonstrate the national position about on this issue. And what were the port responses about these problems? Between uh, 2006 and 2008, uh, some, uh, some ports began measuring their emissions using ISO standards. In 2008, by the World Port Climate Declaration, 50 points commit to uh, reduce the emissions. Um, in 2010, the carbon footprint guide for ports was published uh, with a um, special uh, methodologies for this sector. Mm, the following years, port alliances began to emerge to promote uh, action and strategies against the climate change. Programs 
and uh, projects were created mm, to develop mm, sustainable and resilient ports. The Port of Bahia Blanca is part of these alliances and the regional importance uh, enables to it to promote uh, mm, transformations uh, against the climate change and the sustainable development aligned with the national goals in, in the fight of the climate change and uh, the 2030 and this mm, SDGs or, or 2030 uh, agenda. Mm, that's why the, in, 19, uh, in 2019, the Port of Bahia Blanca requests our group from the Technological University to um, carry on, to carry out the um, uh, GHG inventory and the port um, and the, the port carbon footprint uh, estimation. The Port of Bahia Blanca it was the first port in Argentina to take this initiative. We were uh, estimated the carbon footprint at the port uh, twice, and the second was by the year 2020. Here, I was uh, to point out about uh, mm, Port of La Bahia de Blanca uh, characteristics which are relevant uh, when assessing uh, emissions. The Port of Bahia Blanca is located inside an estuary and it can be read by sea along uh, a 97 kilometer gas channel. It is one of the most of port in Argentina. It commercializes about 25 million tons per year. Mm, the activities that carry out in the port jurisdictions uh, are, uh, as, re as regard uh, cargo logistics uh, at uh, 14 berth, also other activities Linked to the land transport um, of the transport of goods to and from the hinterland. Here, uh, it's important to point out that in our country, uh, this uh, tra uh, this transportation is uh, raised by trucks. Uh, this this is that. Uh, uh, truck transportation is uh, really ban uh, over railways. And the industrial activities is also into the jurisdiction of the port. Uh, in this area, the three petrochemical industries uh, contribute greatly with the port emissions. And here I want to mention that I want to mention that um, petrochemical hub is also near the port area, but it is in, uh, in inside the jurisdiction. The carbon footprint is the sum of emission from the GHG sources in the port jurisdiction. Uh, following, we uh, were it identified like um, as uh, GHG sources in the port area. First, 
the consumption of liquid fuels, including uh, cargo, handy equipment at docks, land transport, trucks and trains, and maritime transport, uh, the ships. The consumption of electricity and natural gas from different activities and processes, the, cons the referent gas leaks from production areas of the, of the industry and air conditioning. Four, the generation and management of solid waste and effluents. And last but not least, the gaseous emissions from petrochemical process. The criteria applied, it was into consideration all the activities uh, in the port. In the, uh, those of, uh, those of, uh, mm, including those of uh, port administrations, those of consortium partners, and the industrial ones. Maritime transportation uh, is, uh, was, uh, uh, was evaluated by navigation through along the access channel and time at docks. As regards land transportation, it was assessed um, con uh, considering uh, average distances in hinterland and within the port area. This activity is also evaluated in relation to cargo logistics and the industry. As you see in the graph, the first result uh, show uh, that the wasted contributions arise from electric consumption, truck transportation, natural gas. This one is due to the impact of the industry. And the first place uh, was the contribution of uh, ships. In, uh, in this point, I uh, have to mention that the um, gaseous emission from the petrochemical activities uh, are not in the graph because the magnitude distorts the scale. Mm, they emerge as a work axis uh, to be implemented to minimize the port emissions. First, minimizing electricity and natural gas consumption. Second, incorporating renewable energy sources. Third, implementing energy, uh, port energy services like onshore uh, for ships, onshore uh, energy for ships. And fourth, improving sustainability in cargo logistics. Although during the work, uh, needs arose to implement data management system and environmental awareness and training programs. The first result show uh, that energy is an aspect to be managed. And the, the incorporation of renewable energy is essential if it could minimize emissions. The transition towards renewable energy must be linked to energy efficiency. However, this transition is not just a decarbonization process or a technological issue. 
for the port of Bahia Blanca, the energy transition implies reducing the energy and the environmental impact of the energy use. Mm, therefore, this is a process that cuts across all the port activities. In this sense, the port of Bahia Blanca has begun to implement these actions. As regard energy efficiency strategies, uh, the diagnosis of energy management was carried out, which resulted in technological renovation in areas like lighting and air conditioning. And currently, onshore energy uh, docks is being evaluated. On the other hand, the concessionaries of the port are advancing in incorporation, incorporation uh, of, renewa of renewable energy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, data uh, systematization has begun in the port administration to um, better monitor the emissions. And we are in the process to implementing circular economy in waste management. The carbon footprint is used as an indicator to monitoring this transition. On the other hand, uh, the Bahia Blanca port is undergoing in a change process. It is passing from an agro-exporter profile to having an, an, an important energy role. And once it's done in a decarbonization and energy transition process, strategies can be uh, implemented. And how can we can evaluate it, these strategies? We are using the carbon footprint as a tool to evaluate future scenarios uh, of uh, port activities and action implementation. Both carbon footprint uh, measurement serve as a diagnosis and now they provide the basis of calculating emissions. In this way, for each scenario, the sectorial incidence of the CHG and port emissions can be estimated. And these um, scenarios result can be modified and adjust uh, in a, a process of exchange with the actors from the port activity. And we can ask ourselves, uh, what is the challenge that the Bahia Blanca port uh, must face to energy transition? Is optimizing process linked to energy consumption with an energy transition perspective based on energy security, energy justice, and energy sustainability. The challenge is to carry out this energy transition in a port growth based on activities linked to the processing of natural gas and hydrocarbons. And the carbon neutral by the year 2050 is uh, the new port goal. The carbon footprint is the tool chosen by the Port of Bahia Blanca for planning and monitoring mitigation actions. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Daniela. Is there any question? No? Oh, yeah. Lo pregunto en español porque es media compleja la pregunta. Eh, a nivel local, ¿existe alguna normativa que fomente el uso, a la, la transición a energías renovables para las empresas? O, por, por ejemplo, a nivel local tenemos los autos eléctricos no pagan patente. Pero así para las empresas, ¿existe una normativa que fomente eso, esa transición? ¿Tiene? ¿No? O sea, es meramente este, voluntad de, de las empresas locales de querer pasarse a una matriz energética. No, ah. existen co eh, compromisos asumidos por el país mediante la ley para eh, cumplir con eh, determinados eh, valores o no incremento de las emisiones. Por eso se, se están midiendo a nivel nacional o sea, hay dos mediciones hechas de eh, las emisiones globales eh, de, de Argentina. Pero todavía no, no tenemos una ley específica para enfocar a transición energética. So, I have a question towards the end of your presentation you mentioned energy justice as one of the objectives. Um, and I'm just wondering how, whether methodologies already exist to be able to assess and evaluate energy justice, or whether this is something that will be, need to be done in the future. Eh, no, estamos en un, en, eh, we are in a process to, eh, to promote strategies to this, eh, currently no. Okay, thank you, Daniela. I'm going to finish this off before I leave <laughs> the room. Um, well, Last but not least, uh, my my colleague here, Martin, is going to. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do a very brief presentation of yourself. You just colleague who is uh, is the head of uh, innovation and development here in the port of Bahia Blanca, which is actually pretty recent. The the area that was uh, three years back. Can it be less? two and a half years, well, and uh, so he's been doing a, a great job at placing us uh, on on the map with uh, A plus D, so I'll leave the, the floor to you. Thank you, Gerardo, for introducing me. Yes, my work is to put Boya Blanca in all the maps. When I see a map without Boya Blanca, I go in crazy. <laughs> okay. Uh, yellow. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. It's not easy. No. This is your presentation, not mine. Yes, my, the main topic of my presentation is to talk about our potential to to turn Bahia Blanca into a clean hydrogen hub, but let me take a couple of minutes to talk about some projects related with, ah, what? We have a, a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Uh, yes. I'm sorry.
Would you be TV if we would be better? Uh, as as Daniela said, we are uh, working uh, shoulder to shoulder with the university group uh, in our energy transition strategy. Uh, we we don't have already a a, energy, a properly energy transition plan, but. But we are doing some some kind of project uh, that I show you in a couple of minutes. I don't prepare any show to to say. Uh, from the port of Boya Blanca, we face uh, energy transition uh, with two main goals. One, of course, is decarbonization, and the other why is to take advantage of all the opportunities that energy transition are bringing to us. Uh, but I will continue. I say you in the following slides. But uh, as I said. Uh, we already are working in some projects uh, with the goal of decarbonization our operations. Uh, as already Daniela uh, said, uh, this year with uh, her group, we made some uh, modeling of uh, scenarios uh, based in the our carbon footprint and using different assumptions uh, related with growth, uh, emission, et cetera, thinking uh, and find, in order to find the better ways to mitigate our emissions. Uh, we, all, we are working uh, in another project uh, and as we are thinking to, to implement a pilot project in more or less two years related with our power supply in our uh, uh, in one of our terminals uh, we are also thinking you know a green for in a, a, i'm sorry in our own grid photovoltaic solar project uh, in order to supply energy to this building uh, it's a scope one uh, action we are thinking only in one and two scope uh, actions because uh, as Daniela said, uh, trucks, trains, and ships emissions are uh, difficult to to diminish uh, from from us. Okay, uh, it's cra it's crazy because uh, now we are a oil and gas exporter port. And we are working in a national transition plan. No, it's this. This is, doesn't sound good, but we think in the near future, uh, not oil, not only oil and gas, uh, are going to be our growth driver, but also uh, hydrogen and its carriers are going to turn into a, a huge uh, growth driver for us. In this way, to understand more about the, the, the hydrogen economy and to know uh, how we help the, our complex industry complex and the city to make a plan uh, related with the hydrogen economy, we joined two work groups in 2021. One of them is the Global Port Hydrogen Coalition. It's a, a global group of ports that are Sporting ammonia or thinking to sport uh, green ammonia. And the other one, the H2R Consortium, is a work group uh, when uh, leading by YPF Technology, the technological company of YPF, our 
uh, national company of petroleum and uh, there is there are more than 50 companies that uh, are part or want to be part of the value uh, hydrogen value chain Uh, as I said, uh, trying to know, understand more about the economy, uh, the hydrogen economy, uh, this year we did a, a diagnosis study uh, with uh, other research groups. Uh, El Plapiki is a, a research group uh, from the National University here in Bahia Blanca. Uh, we, with him, with them, we try to find some uh, facts related with uh, our potential uh, in our in, uh, in the hydrogen hub. One important thing is that Bahia Blanca is already a hydrogen hub. Of course, no blue or green, but uh, it's a great hydrogen hub in Bahia Blanca. Uh, Today, uh, more than 200,000 tons per year of hydrogen are produced. Uh, ammonia is produced and exported. And also, uh, we have uh, our port infrastructure ready to export uh, not only ammonia, but also uh, e fuels. To complement the information that Daniela said related with the CO2 emissions in the port, we made an inventory uh, of CO2 emissions, but the all industrial complex of the city, not only the, the, the port area. And it's in interesting to, to say that we have uh, chimney emissions of CO2, but also have uh, more than 1 million tons years the CO2 by from uh, process streams. No? It's, that's it's interesting because this CO2 is ready to be used in another industrial processes. And of course, there are a lot of opportunities to capture storage and use uh, CO2. Another important fact uh, about uh, Bahia Blanca and its region is our potential uh, to produce renewable energy through uh, wind farms. Uh, today, just taking 55 kilometers around, uh, we are producing more than 1,000 megawatts of renewable energy. And there are room for a lot of more production in the region. The port of Villablanca is one of the 38 ports around the world, uh, which is ammonia is already exported. Uh, today, uh, as, as I said, in Villablanca, gray hydrogen is produced, ammonia is produced and exported, and, and storage. We are ready to see other projects and, and be able to share this infrastructure with, with them. One important point about uh, our potential to turn into clean, uh, clean hydrogen hub is we already have a project related with the production of green hydrogen. Profertil, a fertilizer company, uh, in very close here, and six block from here. Uh, Profertil is the main pro hydrogen producing the uh, of the country. Uh, they produce ammonia and fertilizers for our internal market. And Profertil showing forces with YPF, YPF loose, and Topso uh, to implement a green ammonia project for export uh, in the next three years. Uh, they are thinking to start exporting ammonia at the end of 2026 or the beginning of 2027. Uh, 
of course, there are a, a lot of things to do in the middle. Uh, we uh, talking about regulations. We are waiting for the hydrogen law in Argentina. It's, uh, this is uh, is key to to help projects to to develop in in our country. But uh, we are confident to that project will be producing in three or four years here. And finally, if, if you see uh, the hydrogen uh, value chain uh, in Bahia Blanca, uh, already are um, almost all activities that the hub uh, need to have. For example, we already have renewable energy production, natural gas, thinking in, in blue hydrogen, uh, ammonia production, ammonia exportation, uh, a mature supply chain uh, for the chemical complex, but also for the wind farms uh, production. Uh, that's, that's why uh, from the port of Bahia Blanca uh, are working on develop a, a hub uh, here. Uh, with all of this information, we are thinking to start next year a master plan uh, because we need to uh, study deeply how to the better way to implement uh, a, a hub here, for example, we we think uh, for me uh, to be more competitive and more efficient uh, is key to share infrastructure with all the projects, uh, the port infrastructure, storage, uh, the electrolysis area, the energy transport. Uh, if you, if I, if we want to maximize the our land uh, and minimize the the impact in the environment, uh, this master plan is is very important for for us and for the, the future of of the city. Thank you. If you have any questions, just ask me. So the Bahia Blanca port is planning not only to export hydrogen, but also to to use it as an as a energy source for the internal operation. Am I right? Uh, the hydrogen, the hydrogen, I'm sorry, is is already a a raw material from more than one industries here, uh, from produce ammonia for, for heating. Uh, for the uh, refinery, uh, we think that uh, Argentina and especially Bahia Blanca uh, will be a lot of and cheaper gas for a lot of years. That's why, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, the first step is to turn Bahia Blanca in a key player for the energy transition of the rest of the world. And in the second step, uh, the local industry will uh, be used our hydrogen uh, for industrial purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Well then. Um, we have reached then the the end of the of the day. It's been a, quite a long day, but uh, I think we we had very good presentations. And uh, I don't know you, but uh, I'm pretty satisfied with the outcome. 
So uh, I would like, first of all, to thank all of you who presented today, uh, both ones here and Dries in Belgium. And uh, also thank all the people that's been present today. And uh, well, we hope that uh, it's been up to your expectations. And uh, we we will try to continue the, the work we're doing. Um, we will have the presentations in PDF for uh, those who, who want to have it, please contact me. I'll, uh, I'll send it by email. So with uh, no further ado, uh, thank you all again very much and uh, <laughs> have, a, have a good day. Bye. Sorry, before you leave the, the premises, I think uh, Claudia deserves the